Let her sit down. Good morning and welcome to the Board of Education's third FY 2024 operating budget work session. Today we will complete our review of the superintendent's proposed FY24 operating budget. The order of review is reflected in the agenda. Staff will continue to walk us through the superintendent's recommended operating budget by chapter. The board is scheduled to take tentative action on the operating budget at our February 23rd board business meeting. As we go through today's budget chapters, I urge staff to point out pertinent issues that may be of concern to the board. Uh, let's start out by having our board members introduce themselves, starting with Mr. Kim. Good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, oh, good morning, everyone. How are you doing? <laughs> good morning. Shebra, good morning to everyone. Good to see you. I'm Carla Sylvester. Brenda Wolf, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Grace Rara Oven, District 1. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Julie Ye. Okay. And if you don't have um, your agenda on you, I just wanted to run through um, the chapters that we will be covering. Chapter 7 is District Operations. Uh, we have um, the Human Capital Management, Finance. Then we're taking a 15 minute recess followed by administration and oversight, and finally the accelerators in the FY24 recommended operating budget. I understand we have, this is a lot of content, so we uh, will probably use our, our full hours that we have planned for this um, session. I always remind uh, my fellow board members to ask direct questions and I ask staff to please answer uh, directly as possible as well so that we can get to the gist of the matter and, um, and make progress. So, uh, Dr. Knight, do you have any comments before we begin? Um, need to jump right now. Okay, then we are ready to begin. Thank you, Ms. Silvestri. Um, so I am looking forward to our conversation today. Today is one of several budget meetings that we've had. I did want to share before walking over here, I had just a couple of minutes to read uh, some of the articles from the clip uh, that we put out every morning. And, you know, it was interesting. One of the articles taught, referenced the MCPS student data performance, which was a presentation that we shared yesterday and how I utilized that data to really talk about why this budget is important. So um, I thought that couldn't be more timely to remind us of that. Um, yesterday we saw a lot of areas in which we've been able to stay, stay steady, which we know are going to then extend to growth, and we saw some areas that we are going to really need to focus on um, moving forward. And so as we talk about the accelerators um, today and the budget for the remaining sessions, I think it's going to be really important to come back to how are our students currently doing and how are these accelerators or these investments going to continue to move us in the right direction. So thank you all board members for being there yesterday. This is one of the most important things we can always keep at the forefront of our minds as well as our families, how our students are doing so that um, again we can make very good decisions about what, what needs to be ahead of us. So today we're going to focus on chapters of the budget which represent district operations, human resources, uh, finance and oversight and administration. Um, in addition, we're also going to discuss the 47 million accelerators that were included in the recommended budget. We made a decision to hold that as a separate conversation so that we could just talk about the accelerators separately. So um, again, I think a timely connection into our conversations yesterday. We will discuss what these accelerators are and why these accelerators are needed this year and how those accelerators are an opportunity for us to extend in the future, aligned to the board strategic priorities because those are the things that we you know you've said consistently that needs to drive the work of the system and um, again the student data I think further emphasizes how we use those accelerators to further the board's priorities and uh, um, drive student learning in the way that we need to so these accelerators are around the whole theme that I've shared from the beginning of this budget how we support students um, so that they can continue to build 
for those who need to uh, catch up some ground and support students so that they can continue to extend themselves. Um, the second is so that we can continue to keep pathways of acceleration open for our students so that they are not limited. And third, yesterday I mentioned the word reconstruction, um, which <laughs> uh, someone noted in the article, um, that innovation is going to be important because we're reconstructing the system in so many different ways to work for what we need today. Um, so that means we're in many ways trying to create um, from scratch <laughs> in, in some sense. So as we think about support, accelerate, and innovating, um, those accelerators speak to us focusing on those themes as we move forward in the budget. So throughout the work sessions, you've had very thoughtful questions. We've been able to hear from the public in the hearing, so I look forward to those things continuing to drive our discussion today as we discuss the accelerators. All right, thank you. With that, I will turn it over to Mr. Hall. Great, thank you, Dr. McKnight, President Silvestre, board members. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today, and we are excited for our third and final work session around the operating budget for FY24. Um, I think Dr. McKnight gave a pretty good uh, introduction there is what we will be covering today. Uh, we will you know, try to walk through these final four chapters, uh, which are more operationally focused um, you know, as quickly as we can so that we can uh, move on to the accelerators. I know that there's been um, some pent up questions around those, and so Dr. Murphy Murphy will give kind of a high-level overview as to um, why these accelerators and how they fit together to move forward the superintendent's vision for accelerating student learning. Um, we'll then walk through the accelerators, highlighting some of the big ones, and then, of course, uh, open it up to discussion and questions from the board members uh, about anything that they would like to discuss around the accelerators um, or beyond that. So uh, I will stop there and turn it over to uh, Mr. Riley. Good morning, President Silvestri, Vice President Evans, uh, Dr. McKnight, and board members. Uh, can we have the slideshow? Um, next slide. Uh, so. Uh, next slide actually is the agenda which we've gone through. Today is the last work session and we'll be covering those chapters as well as the review of accelerators. Next slide. Um, so here we just want to uh, reiterate too that uh, this board was built upon the board's uh, strategic plan as well as the board's priorities, building a safe and inclusive school climate, improving math and literacy rates, improving retention and recruitment, as well as supporting two-way communication. Um, as you noted in the previous six chapters, we've used these icons to highlight within the presentation of, uh, you know, where you know, where these items in the budget uh, fit. You'll see that as well today, as well as in the accelerators, we've, we've kind of used that. Uh, next slide. Uh, again, a review. Uh, so uh, we have a $3.2 billion budget, which is a $235 million increase or 8% uh, increase from the current budget. These are our big buckets. Uh, enrollment changes, which represents $14.9 million. Um, inflation reductions, rate change, uh, kind of a conglomerate of different things within our same service budget. Uh, you've seen a lot of the inflation and rate changes in previous discussions at the previous two work sessions. Today you'll see even more because a, a lot of this number actually is in district operations as well as um, uh, finance as well, too. Uh, salaries, benefits, and health care is currently uh, being negotiated, and the final item, as noted, was accelerators, which we'll go into depth later on today. So with that, I'm going to pass it on to uh, Ms. Dana Edwards, our Chief of District Operations. Good morning. Good morning, President Silvestri, Vice President Evans, Dr. McKnight, and the Board of Education. Um, you shared who I am, so I won't say that again. Um, <laughs> I'm here and I will speak to you this morning about the same services bu budget for district operations. And so one thing I will say is while the outcome for every school district across the nation and across the world is to make sure that students learn, the one thing is that there must also be effective and exemplary operations and resources to create those conditions for equitable teaching and learning. And so you will hear about some of those things in chapter six. Seven. Operational excellence is the third priority in the board's strategic plan. And in my office, every day we strive and we focus on anticipating and providing resources um, for students, staff, and families. And there is a layer also of what we do that we must quickly respond to operational emergencies to limit any type of disruption to instruction. This makes sure that your priority and the, um, the, the third priority in the strategic plan is 
lived and it's a valued part of everything that we do as a district and it is a daily practice. Where our staff works, where our students come to school and where parents uh, send their children and families send their children every day, it's an extension of everyone's home. And we want to make sure that those experiences, the learning, and the working conditions really create a climate and school culture that people can be proud of and can be comfortable in. The equity in these conditions, especially in those experiences, are really important. And so we try to be deliberate in creating that environment and fostering any type of community in which we can and which people can thrive. We remain student-centered on what we do and how we make our decisions. The next slide. So in the Office of District Operations, we are comprised of several different departments and divisions that you see on this screen. We are the Department of Facilities Management. In the Department of Facilities Management, we focus not only on uh, the construction of our buildings, but really thinking about the capacity within each of our different clusters, maintaining those facilities, as well as the sustainability components that are throughout the district. The Department of Labor Relations, we work collectively with our associations and really thinking about, I mentioned earlier, the working conditions, the things in which our staff need in order to be able to deliver the quality education and create the conditions on a daily basis. The Department of Materials Management definitely supports the resources that come within our buildings every day, whether it be food, furniture, paper, and really creating an opportunity for people to use those to be able to support the needs of our district. The Department of System safety and emergency management, working on really supporting the needs of all of our schools and offices around the safety and security within our buildings on a daily basis. The Department of Transportation, delivering our students, whether it be in, in county and or out of county, in order to be able to access the educational components of their day. Division of, of Appeals works directly with our families um, in looking at any appeals that families may have have, as well as around the extended uh, suspension and disciplinary process. And our Student Welfare and Compliance um, Office focuses on the Title IX components within our district, working very closely with communities as well as uh, families and students. As you can see, we are focused on providing those resources and making them accessible to students and families, regardless of zip code, neighborhood, or school status. As we continue to do this, what I will share uh, moving forward is our same services budget. And along with realignments within the department and divisions, you will also hear about some rate changes that align with the current state in the world. High inflation, unpredictable delivery windows, availability of materials, while we still have to have a high flexibility of providing the best experiences and resources for students. If you go to the next slide, the, the $421.1 million budget in the Office of District Operations is comprised of the items that you see within the pie chart. $240.2 million are salaries and wages of all central office employees and district operations. It also includes our staff and substitutes at the bus depots, our warehouse and central food service employees, and our maintenance and operations staff. The $27.1 million in contractual services support our building rentals, preventive maintenance contracts, emergency services that we provide to the district. $53.9 million for supplies and materials include this, the food our students eat, tires and parts for buses, paper and ink for editorial graphics, and any replacement furniture that we need to look at for schools and offices. The, th the $73.1 million for other it's somewhat understated, but it also includes our relocatable classrooms found throughout the school district, as well as the utilities for our property, schools, and work sites. And it also includes the staff development, as well as local fund for the seven areas that I mentioned prior. And then finally, the $26.8 million for equipment includes the parts needed um, and the maintenance for our vehicles on both our electric, uh, for, our, for our, excuse me, our diesel buses, as well as any parts and materials for our our equipment throughout the district. Next slide. 
Our intention through this uh, budget is to provide continuous and efficient operations for the future. And this coming year's recommended budget does include alignments within the five areas that you see in the first part of the slide deck. Under maintenance and operations, we've been very thoughtful about what will be needed to maintain our buildings and the overall needs. This is a two-year project in terms of where we looked at some of our general maintenance system technicians who are extremely knowledgeable, but what we learned was that we needed people who had more finite skills. So we took approximately 79 of those positions and we converted them into electricians, HVAC, plumbers, who can do very skilled and specific work versus being generalist. And so this is the second year um, in that conversion, and so that realignment supports the overall maintenance of our building and the needs that are there. Next um, is the realignment in the Division of Sustainability and Compliance. We had three vacant positions in sustainability and compliance, a program manager, a specialist, and a utility analyst. In recent years, we've done a lot of work through the policy, um, and we wanted to be able to create positions that would support us moving forward. We realigned those three vacant positions into two project managers who will focus on energy savings, a communication support specialist, we do a lot of collaboration with students and with the community, and we want to be able to enhance those project plans and to be able to do more, but as well as to be able to communicate the work that we're doing in a very fluid way to all of our stakeholders. And a data support specialist to support the collection and analysis of our tracking efforts as well. In the Department of Transportation, we are shifting a depot manager position to fund an additional safety trainer. We currently have 12 safety trainers. Um, the safety trainers are the ones who are responsible for training our bus operators and aides with their CDLs, um, making sure that they have everything that they need. By adding another uh, safety trainer, what this does is it gives us an opportunity to expand the number of people in the class. It also gives us the opportunity to offer more classes as well um, at a greater frequency and provide any one-on-one -on -one support that our future bus operators and our aides will need. Also in transportation, there's about $100,000 from an office vacancy in non-position salaries, and we will use that to fund additional routing and communication support for administrative support within the Office of Transportation. There's also a realignment in our fleet. We currently have 85 electric buses in our fleet, and we are set to have another 120 arrive by mid-June. By 2024, MCPS will have 326 electric buses. And to continue to support the, the purchase of those vehicles, we are shifting $2.7 million from the lease of the diesel buses. As we continue this transition, we are projected to save about $1.6 million in fuel and I'll talk about, and lubricants, and I'll talk about that a little bit later in the presentation. The Department of Materials Management, there would be a realignment in that area as well. The Division of Procurement, and Mr. Riley will talk about that during his presentation, will be shift, is shifted into Chapter 9. There were two positions that remained uh, within the uh, Department of Materials Management, and we will be shifting those positions over into um, the whole procurement department come uh, the, like, for next year. And then finally, in materials management, we are realigning a vacant publication supervisor to a customer service specialist. This uh, position is really important because they work directly with our schools in terms of tickets for the prom, doing things for graduation publications, and they're able to go out and meet directly with the schools, understand the vision, and be able to provide a nice product to the community. And then final realignment in the Department of Safety and Security Management, system-wise, safety and emergency management is a 1.0 realignment from a, from a vacant position within maintenance and operations to support a security assistant position for central office locations. Okay. In addition, on this slide, we, I also show growth with an increase of about 2.0 positions, um, total of $505,000, and that's in the Department of Transportation. In transportation, we have 1,401 buses in our fleet. 
and we have approximately 1,230 routes that we run on a daily basis. Of our six depots, we have two that have 200 and more routes. And when we really think about operational efficiency, um, the management that goes along with it, we wanted to step back and look at a different way of approaching it. So we will, um, we are in the process right now of looking at one of our depots, our West Farm Depot, who uh, they have 279 bus routes that come in and out of that depot today compared to their other depots who have anywhere between 168 and 171. And we want to be able to split those two depots in half to increase operational efficiency, customer service to the schools, as well as working with the families within the different communities. And so in order to do that, we would uh, we want to use those funds to be able to address the needs for a transportation cluster manager and a bus route supervisor to be able to support the needs that are there. And finally, in terms of uh, the space increase, um, we are opening a new elementary school next year, Clarksburg number nine, in addition to other new facilities that we have on tap. And we must take into account the additional space that comes with those facilities. So in the total of about $2.4 million, we are adding about 15.5 positions to think about building services, food services, to be able to support those locations with the additional square footage, um, in addition to bus drivers and attendants, as well as the uniforms that those staff members will need in order to perform the functions of their duties. Next slide. To close out, I will discuss the increases that are associated with inflation and access to materials and supplies. For our food services fund, um, we are addressing some budget needs that are there to meet um, expected revenue projections with the increased cost of food for this year, um, specifically around dairy products and meat and poultry. We want to, con we are going to continue to buy food. That's that's a no-brainer, but <laughs> we have to pay for it, and so we want to be mindful of that. We've seen about a 5 to 35 percent increase depending on the type of food, and so we want to be mindful and ready for that. Our field trip fund, um, this is to meet expected revenue projections, and there's a decrease um, of a specialist position, a two specialist position, 0.25, um, as well as a 1.0 business service analyst position to realign those funds in order to be able to use into the local budget. And then in the division of sustainability and compliance increases of $4.0 million for utilities and approximately $135,000 for uh, environmental compliance. Next slide, please. Um, I have one more slide. I'm sorry, uh, I was prepared for one more slide, um, but maybe we will discuss it. Uh, uh, President Silvestri, I turn it over to you for questions from the board. I apologize. No I was over-prepared. Mm -hmm. So the, Better. the bus app will be uh, discussed at the end as an accelerator, is that correct? Yes, the bus app will be discussed at the end. That is a request for new funding and not realignment of any funds. Okay. Um, I'll start over on my right-hand side. If my colleagues have questions, please turn on your light. And let's, this time around, let's ask two questions each, and then we'll go back around um, and see if there are remaining questions. Ms. Wolf. Um, thank you for the presentation. I wanted to know if all of our schools are fully staffed with security assistance. Ms. Wolf, I will have to um, take a look at that information and return back to the board with that answer. I know at the beginning of the year we were. You know, we had a few vacancies that we were able to fill, but please allow me to come back with that response. Okay, no problem. But I also have a request. Sure. We've been getting a lot of concerning emails from Silver Spring International Middle Schools, and I was hoping that somebody could either go over there and convene a community meeting or either, you know, take a visit through there and try to assess what the real issue is that needs to be addressed. I know last time I asked you to look on the outside of the school. This time I want you to look on the inside of the building 
and I'm sure that you're getting the same emails that we're getting, so I don't have to really go into it, but you know what needs to be looked at. Just to give you a soft update, I know that um, one of our security supervisors, cluster security coordinators, as well as the associate for that school are visiting today based on many of the emails that we have been receiving just about the things that you're speaking about that are on the inside. So please allow for us to do that, and then we will definitely come back to you with a summary. Thank you. I had a question about um, bus driver pay. Is this the chapter to ask that question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, so what is our bus driver pay rate currently? Um, do you have that information? Uh, I don't have that on I don't have it with me. I know that we just did an increase last year, if the board remembers, as a part of our working yeah. conditions. So we, when we did that increase, we put ourselves right on par with um, local ride on. Um, so I can share that with you before the end of the day. Okay. Yeah, I'm interested. I, I, um, I'm very interested overall in terms of our competitive competitiveness with um, the region. And so I'd like to know um, the starting bus, just the, as much as information as you have on the pay rate, starting bus pay, and also what DC is paying, what Prince George's County is paying, Howard and Frederick. Mm -hmm. And right. Mm -hmm. And right on. Thank you. And we will follow up. That was one of the what, that was one of the big uh, moves that we made last year because we saw that as a great opportunity to bring people to the district. In addition, we just had our pay increase, so that should have moved us up. But allow us to send that to you as well as the comparisons from other surrounding districts. Ms. Edwards, and I know that pay is not the only uh, factor, it's an important factor, but uh, working conditions are also important. What do bus drivers tell you when you talk to them in terms of uh, what, what makes Montgomery County an attractive place to come work, or what would they, would, what would they like to see Montgomery County offer or, or do more of to make it a more attractive place to work? I know in the past we've talked about um, they were not full-time positions. I know we've made some adjustments to be able to offer additional duties for some, but could you just elaborate on um, on that question, please? Absolutely. Um, we have had um, some conversations with uh, several of our bus operators at a few of our depots, in addition to staying in sync with the leadership within DOT. A couple of the things that we hear, one, you highlighted one, just in terms of the length of time in which they're working. The second component was really around the professional development and professional growth opportunities. We highlight the bus is the first classroom because that is the first phase, that's the first location our students um, enter into the morning and it's kind of a level setting for them to be able to walk into the school building. The place in which we have not um, really uh, developed fully and we're in the process of doing that for the spring is being able to provide some of our anti-racist training to our bus drivers as well as the bus aides. Thinking about the cultural, um, the cultural diversity and being able to highlight that, but also we call it classroom management in the school. We have to think about bus management as well, as well as building relationships. So we are in the process of really developing with our bus operations staff, the actual, and having staff deliver this PD to our bus operators and aides, the things in which they want to hear and they need to see, as well as the other training across the district. The other component around our transportation staff that I have found so endearing is that it is a commitment for many of them. There are many people I meet, their parents worked as bus operators. They saw their parent driving a bus, and so they did that as well. And so they want a trajectory. They want to be able to come, grow roots, and see themselves grow over time within the Department of Transportation and or take that knowledge and move to another office within the district that will give people a perspective of that operational arm of the district. So. So 
um, as we look into next year, one of the accelerators that Mr. Hull will highlight is really thinking about how we build the leadership capacity of our operations managers, one, and then two, um, being able to do a lot of collaboration and build off of um, the career pathways work that we've looked at and thinking about if I am a bus aide or an operator now, where is it that I want to go? What experiences do I need to have? And doing that within the workday. And that has been a conversation with SEIU, I would say, for the last four or five years. And we really want to be able to capitalize on that. So I'm excited to highlight um, when I think about a person that stands out within the Department of Transportation. Sheena Seegers is one, and she is our bus operations manager. And her mom was a driver. And she started out as an aide, and now she's in a leadership position. So not only the knowledge, but the passion and commitment. And we want to grow that across all six depots because it's infectious. It goes down to our children, and then they get excited, and to our families. So I know that was long-winded because I got excited. Um, so <laughs> I will pull that back, and hopefully that answers your question. So if I, if I want to work full-time as a bus driver in an MCPS mm -hmm. with benefits, I can get a job? You would not, they still do shift work um, in terms of the number of hours they drive their routes in the morning and in the afternoon. However, there are a few pieces in which we've thought of, been very thoughtful about. One, during the middle of the day, there are field trip opportunities, which gives additional components for pay. In addition to that, um, there, um, we, we also did a survey to our bus operators and aides who may have been interested in doing some work within our schools. Um, so they are not full-time in terms of a full seven-hour. However, we created different opportunities to be able to increase the pay. And then also thinking about those professional development opportunities that would provide that for them as well. So the answer is no. No. Yes. Thank you. I have a follow-up follow to, to um, Ms. Silvestri's question. Well, it's a data question, so I'm not going to expect an answer right now. When you compare the salaries to other regions, or to other counties, can you also tell me what they get for doing an extra route versus what our people get for doing an extra route? Thank you. And to keep following up on that, <laughs> whether they also in other counties um, actually have full-time positions or not. Um, but hearing from uh, quite a few uh, bus drivers, there's a, a question of also security. They're the first face that they see. and. And um, and I'm just interested to know on disciplinary issues on the buses. Have we seen an increase of that? And what kind of training do our bus drivers get on escalation or other kind of training that they get uh, in dealing with um, with students who are having you know who are having issues and the follow up that there is, or anything on mental health um, and so on. And the last question I had for you, you had mentioned um, so you. are are you eliminating any positions? Because when when I was taking notes, and I'm sorry, um, you mentioned there was a specialty position that I think was being eliminated at the end of your presentation. Um, and there is, just curious, on the data position, I'm just curious, um, under, uh, in page 14, is a data support specialist. I'm just curious what that person, what kind of data is that person going to capture? You had a few questions. Uh, no, it's okay, no, I'm going to answer all of them and if I miss one, please let me know. Um, in terms of the training, that um, that was something that we heard directly from our bus staff, that they needed some of that professional development around the work with students on the bus. That's what we will be offering later in the spring to be able to provide that opportunity for them. They receive some information at the beginning of the year through their in-service, but not at the level in which they've requested in order to be able to have that continuous relationship, continuous to work with our students, um, and really um, 
give them the opportunity to service students in the way in which we want them to. So we will build that out with them um, to be able to do that. In terms of cuts for positions, there are realignments around vacant positions, um, positions in which they've been vacant for some time. So we're repurposing the funds to be able to utilize for the needs that we see. And so I highlighted a few of those in the different departments um, and divisions. And the data. Okay. Um, the data specialist was associated with, um, I want to say, the sustainability and compliance, correct, Ms. Evan, in terms of the data specialist. And so that data specialist will be able to support with tracking some of the data that will be coming in, working with the communication support person that we identified um, as a position that we were using funds to realign to determine how we share that information out, as well as working with staff to determine the next steps with those. Did I miss a question? I'm sorry. I think, I think we're, we're going to, you said you were going to find out about the compatibility of pay. Absolutely. And I'll share that back with the board. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I'm interested in knowing about the cost for utilities. Uh, we, uh, right now, it has 44.3 million budgeted. And I'm interested to see as we are working on sustainability, our CERB team is working hard. We have put in some solar roof and have new buildings that are more environmentally friendly. You don't have to give me the data now. I'm interested to see if our costs in the utility, um, whether those initiatives have made an impact on our utility cost. Thank you. Uh, just a coming attraction, we're going to be talking about the um, uh, facilities, our sustainability work at the Fiscal Management Committee meeting on Monday, including our Green Schools Initiative, which gets to the culture shift we need to do around decreasing our consumption, but also what we're doing to increase our purchase of renewables. So stay tuned. Um, and I did just want to follow up on uh, Ms. Wolf's uh, comments around um, Silver Spring International Middle School. It was my middle school. I spent three years there. Um, very, very familiar with the site. My son had to navigate that school multiple times on crutches during his three years at that school. And I, I do want to thank Dr. Moran, who I know is working very closely with the community about their concerns. But I do want to highlight that, um, you know, as some of our parents have pointed out, and I, I hope that our response can get to this, is that our staffing guidelines call for two security specialists for middle schools are more or less of that allocation if the, if the school needs dictate. And it's a 14-acre campus. It's an active construction zone. It has been for years. Um, we have, it's been, the building is sliced and diced since the 1930s. Mm. And um, there, it's got an external gymnasium. So multiple ongoing security safety issues. And I really think that we need to be looking at the staffing allocation there through that lens. Um, so just a, a, a comment there. A quick clarifying question. Um, on slide six, we were looking at the breakdown of the district operations budget equipment. Uh, you mentioned vehicles. That's 6% of the budget. Does that include our entire vehicle fleet, both our buses and, I mean, we do have other MCPS vehicles. So is that everything uh, in, when it comes to our, our vehicles? Yes, it is. Um, this is, I'm just trying to make sure my slides line up with yours. Give me one second. Both our, all of our buses as well as our other vehicles in our fleet, yes. Okay, thank, thank you. you. And then just the other, um, you were mentioned, and I do deeply really appreciate this, the conversion in, in our facilities um, and realignment to positions that are specific skills, plumbing, HVAC, um, because I do think it does get to the essential nature of the issues that our schools report to us, our families, our, our teachers. Um, and just my question, are we really looking to intentionally um, reach into our, our programs at Seneca Valley and Edison where students are in those, those content areas, electrical, plumbing, masonry, to, 
to grow our own uh, as we are looking to, to specifically diversify that workforce? I think we have to do a combination of a lot of different things, and that is one area that definitely is ripe for us to consider. Um, these positions, um, as we talk about um, teacher positions that are hard to find, we also talk about difficult positions on the operations layer as well, and those are difficult positions for us to find. So we do have to recruit in a different way, think about our students, but also think about specific schools as well as people in the industry that would be able to come and do the work. So they are a great component for us, um, and I know we have the, um, the Grow Your Own um, initiative through OHRD, uh, and those students Students are trained on our premises, so we will be looking into those programs. Good, because there it's an there's your future workforce right there, um, and I would also mention it aligns with our obligations under the blueprint to be creating true industry apprenticeship opportunities for our students. They could apprentice with us. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, oh, sorry. Sorry. I just wanted to second that, Ms. Harris. Um, a few years ago, right before COVID-19, we actually started a project in which we were looking at areas within the system that we knew we would have um, an influx of retirees mm -hmm. or others, and many of them were actually in our operations area, um, knowing that we have a staff, you know, um, who have been in the system for a while. So I think this is a prime time for us to, to start that. I mean, as much as we are talking about the recruitment programs to bring, uh, to, to grow our teachers within the system, I actually think for every profession that we have or every job that we have in the school system, we have students who can walk in and fill them. Um, and they're always looking for ways to, to, to get involved and build that relationship early. So thank you so much for raising that. I, I really would like for us to to circle back to that because now is a great time to do so. Thank you. Mrs. Modrowski? Yeah, thank you. Um, I have some questions, but I'm not entirely sure that this is the area for them, but um, in along the lines of um, the security issues that um, some of my colleagues have mentioned already at SIMS, um, the cameras um, in our schools for security purposes, both inside and outside. Um, I feel like for a lot of years we keep talking about getting to that point where all of our schools have what they need to be able to um, you know, see, fully see what's going on and, and have access to, to that stuff. Where are we with accomplishing that and why is it taking so long? Thank you for that question, Ms. Mondrowski. That has been a focus of our work this year. As you remember, last year the board provided approximately $250,000 as an accelerator to be able to support moving cameras into the elementary schools. And so what we've done is really look at it in terms of a three-phased approach. One, we have to take care of our elementary schools that do not have any cameras whatsoever and really be thoughtful around that. The second component is we have to look at our elementary schools who have one to two, maybe three cameras and bring them up to speed in terms of the number and give them, you know, put them on par with other locations as well. And then third, really being considerate um, around those who maybe have older technology with those cameras and doing a refresh. So with the board's um, accelerator that was provided last year, as well as additional grant funds from the state, we have been able to move forward with this approach. So um, by the end of this month, we have about 12 schools that we will bring online with additional cameras. Those are elementary schools um, and really being able to work and communicate with them to be able to provide that. The second phase is we will bring additional schools, about 22 to 25 online, and they will um, receive their full install of the cameras by um, May of 2023. I say all these things making sure that the cameras can come in um, is the other piece. Um, and then the last component is we will look at really all schools being outfitted with cameras really by 2024. And we had to push back a little bit because of just the supply component that was being able to be provided. But we wanted to kind of do it in phases to be attentive to, to schools with none, schools with some, and then schools who needed a refresh. 
Once we finish with elementary schools, we will then be thoughtful and look at our secondary schools who may have the original set of cameras or be on set number two. When we're looking at outfitting these locations, we're looking inside and outside. And it's approximately $65,000 for schools that absolutely have none. And so that's why important we, it's important that we use the funding the board gave us, the grants that we have received, and we've also put funding within our CIP to be considerate of that as well. So as we build new buildings, we do renovations, this is a part of what comes with that particular package. So it's not so much a question of needing more money for it. It's a question of not having enough time or product it's to a, get it all accomplished at a slightly faster pace? So I think it, it's, a, it's, um, it's a combination because we're using a little bit of operating, a little bit of, we want to right. use a little bit of CIP of as well as the grant, but we also work with contractors to be able to schedule. So it's their time, but it's also the availability <laughs> um, and bringing, um, having those cameras accessible to us to install. So just using this as an example, the new, you said about new construction, the new Clarksburg number nine, that is going to have cameras Correct. throughout and even in the back area so that if there become portables or whatever else, the back entrances, I know in a lot of our elementary We will schools. look at the outside in terms of the placement um, uh, of those particular cameras. Okay. Yeah. Um, the next question that I had um, is, a, I'm sure, a follow-up question. It's about the ELC. Um, we're doing the um, expanding to grade four. I was curious if you could give me an estimate as what it would cost to add grade five as well. And then um, if I had a question about um, the fully staffing schools and um, kind of relooking at the pay structure, including um, a thought on retention, is this now or is that another? Is that it for accelerators? Okay. So I think your last one about um, ELC, it'll have to be a follow up, right? Right, that's what I said. I didn't, okay. didn't know it answer now, but okay. um, yep, so stipends and staffing stuff is all in the next chapter. Okay. Mr. Kim. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'd like to echo a comment Ms. Harris made about you know the importance of especially those plumbing pieces and those HVAC pieces. That's some, certainly something that I think addresses a lot of community, student, and staff concerns. Uh, along the same kind of line, um, something that was discussed uh, in, in the context of the, the capital budget again was like physical, um, those materials, especially in the bathrooms, I mean like paper towels and soap. Um, that's a you know along the same line of supporting students and making sure our buildings have everything they need is certainly important. Just the other day, I was caught having to to shake the water off my hands uh, on my way back to class, um, and, and you know my takeaway from those conversations is that somewhere there's you know the paper towels exist somewhere. Um, so along along that kind of line between you know uh, the storage of those paper towels and, and where they reach the bathroom, you know where is kind of the disconnect that that this becomes some, something that we hear time and time again from students. Um, and, and what's a, a strategic investment we can make? I imagine that that would look something closer to staffing than you know supply um, to, to to kind of alleviate this this uh, concern that's been raised. So I think a few things, um, we, we do order the supplies, um, we do rely on um, our building service uh, managers within the buildings, they work to look at what they need, they order the supplies that are in the building. Um, one of the, the key components is um, just looking at making sure those supplies get to the locations that they need. Um, we have all, always tried to look at how we do the bathroom checks in between classes to see what needed to be able to replenish between building services as well as security. In addition, um, in the places where we maybe missed or did not know, we do kind of rely on our staff and students to be able to let us know. So included in the supplies and that uh, uh, pie graph was a component around the ordering for toilet paper as well as paper towels that are there. Okay. But we do not want you sh having to shake your hand, so definitely we'll Thank follow you. up. Um, and then the second question I had was around food services. Um, so does that um, 
increase of uh, 4.4 million dollars is the you know menu redesign um, that's been taking place over the past year or so. Uh, is that a consideration in that, or is that kind of addressing just uh, the increased costs, and is that not necessarily a, a budgetary consideration? The increased cost includes all food. So as we look at the menu redesign, there may be different products that we're using, and we do take that into account. Okay. okay. Thank you. No further questions. All right. Um, if we could make these last questions quick, because I would like to move on to HR. Ms. Uh, Rivetta Oven. Very quick. Uh, one of the first things I brought out was feminine products in, in our school bathrooms. I just wanted to ask, um, I know there was legislation passed to ensure that we provide feminine products in the high school bathrooms, middle school, and I think one bathroom at least per elementary school. Um, what I'm hearing, yeah, what I'm hearing from, from, um, from teachers and PE teachers is that that has not really taken place across the district. And I know for a fact that, at least with, with my nonprofit, we support a lot of the, the high schools in Up County to make sure that, and really feminine products are not it's something that their students need. So could you please, um, if that fit into Mr. Kim's question of having the right things in the bathrooms, because I, I thought there was actually even a budget allocated to the schools to be able to do that, um, but it was ha supposed to happen a while ago. Well, let us just follow up. That goes to a, you know, a supply at the local level. You are correct. Those items are supposed to be there. So in our holistic follow-up, we will definitely include that. Thank you for highlighting that for me. Ms. Wolf. I want to get back to this security assistant issue. Ms. Harris raised a point that I think we really need to consider, and that is the number of incidents in any particular school maybe should control how many security assistants a particular school needs. I'm sure there's an allocation formula right now, and every school needs a certain basic number. But I think that there are some situations that are requiring more, and I think we might need to take a look at that. Thank you. Um, yeah, I thank you for, for raising that one, Ms. Wolf. I looked over my shoulder at Mr. Hollis. This was a few years ago he came and presented to the board. I think it was right around time we were doing Seneca Valley mm -hmm. and taking it, taking in consideration the square footage of some of our high schools, how we needed to um, look at the calculation differently. Um, what we now have experienced, that was before COVID, now, kind of after COVID-19, knowing that you know our students need spaces for different reasons, how we've gone to having more lunch outdoors, all of those things, how we even operate in schools look very different. So I think it, it, it requires taking into consideration more of how we move about a school now sure. and all the spaces that we use now that we previously did not use before that we want to actually take a look at um, and revisit that. So thank you for raising that, Ms. Wolf, where we can follow up and do that. Okay. Um, if I may, uh, just a couple follow-ups to some of the things that were raised here um, as staff has been providing some answers um, as we're sitting here. So this, our starting bus driver pay once they get out of the training program is uh, $23.17 an hour, uh, which puts us on par with uh, Frederick County and it puts us above PG. Uh, Howard and DC both contract out their bus services, which uh, having worked in districts that do that uh, just causes a different set of headaches because they also often cannot find drivers um, and there's just it just takes away the flexibility and the authority of the district to actually do something about it then all you can really do is complain to the the service provider that they're not doing a good enough job and they may or may not you know respond to that um, so I, I just wanted to follow up with that you know as we talk about an eight hour day uh, I'm not aware of any districts currently that are doing that that doesn't mean there may not be some but we did look at the cost of that and it would be between a million uh, to possibly a million and a half dollars per depot so overall cost of you know ballpark somewhere to six to eight million dollars um, of additional investments. So um, 
there would be costs there as well. Uh, and then I just wanted to address Mr. Kim's question about the bathroom supplies. You know, that is not something that we would need an additional investment to do. We just need to work with our building service managers to make sure that that is being done, that is part of their job, and we have people that are already assigned to do that. So we will uh, follow up with that along with the feminine hygiene supplies. Um, Mr. Hull, um, could you just repeat, on par with Frederick and above? Uh, above PG. Let me, let me make sure I'm, I'm speaking correctly here. Contracts. DC contracts, Howard contracts, and we are also above Rydon, which is at $22.44. So we're at or above all of our competitors um, with that starting pay. Thank you. Yep. Um, and then I just wanted to also mention, as we talk about the security pieces in some of our elementary schools, um, going forward, when, when we do need to add portable classrooms or you know movable classrooms, we are also going to be taking into consideration the need for security cameras that will go along with that. So anytime going forward where we're adding a portable, we will also be uh, looking at the need for uh, security cameras that would go along with that. Uh, and then finally, I know something was mentioned about uh, the need for additional plumbing and HVAC supports. Uh, we will talk about that when we get to the accelerators. There is an investment in those specific uh, positions within the accelerators. Thank you. Thank you. So if we could move on to the next chapter, please. Okay. Good. Thank you, Ms. Edwards. We're now going to be joined uh, at the table by Dr. Susan Marks. The next section will be on human capital management. Welcome, Dr. Marks. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Ms. Silvestre, Vice President Evans, Dr. McKnight, and members of the board. Uh, the Office of Human Resources and Development is committed to the recruitment, hiring, and development of a diverse workforce in support of student success. The best people get the best results. We support all offices with all things human capital. We do our work through an equity lens and use data to drive our decisions. Our mission is that we are committed to excellence, equity, and lifelong learning. OHRD recognizes the importance of organizational effectiveness and customer service to our employee candidates as well as our current employees. OHRD knows that the diversity of our workforce plays a pivotal role in ensuring equity in our system. We are a stronger school district when individuals of varied backgrounds and experience and perspectives work and learn together. So I uh, will share our budget. Um, human capital management has the smallest budget of all the offices, but we are glad that um, all the uh, office, all the other offices have the uh, people that they need to um, perform the duties to support our students and our staff. So as with other um, offices, most of our uh, budget is in salaries and wages. Our contractual services, we do contract with CAPRO, which is uh, for our employee assistance. We do have an employee assistant staff, but for extra support for our employees. Background screening, as well as contractual services, mostly from research, uh, research for Better Teaching, which is the backbone of our professional growth system. In terms of our supplies and materials, uh, these supplies go uh, throughout the Office of Human Resources and Development, um, mostly training materials, materials for uh, our offices, and uh, materials for recruitment and marketing. In terms of our other, which is the uh, other bigger biggest chunk of our um, budget, uh, most of it is for tuition reimbursement. We are one of the few school systems that I think provide tuition reimbursement for all our employees, for all our union members. Uh, you can get up to nine credits uh, a year um, paid for by Montgomery County Public Schools. It is a wonderful benefit, and we use this in our marketing. We also um, use some um, um, funds to support our university partnerships, particularly in terms of our para 
to teach her pipeline, um, and uh, staff training and travel, particularly for our recruitment team. Next slide, please. Um, all our budget changes are really to support the capacity needs uh, to better support uh, and provide services to our employees and for compliance requirements. So we have um, realigned some staff in terms of the Office of Human Resources and Development. We've realigned two personnel assistants to a staffing assistant to support our uh, classification coordinator. We have over 500 different kinds of positions in Montgomery County. They change uh, uh, throughout the years, and we need to um, really look at the classification and how we grade our positions. We have one person doing that right now. Uh, the Department of Compliance and Investigation, we have realigned some contractual services to a 1.0 background specialist to provide background screening in coordination with Child Protective Services, and this is critical uh, for our district. And in the Department of Human Capital Management, we have realigned a staffing specialist to a higher level staffing specialist specialists that reflects the scope of the work of the substitute team. Uh, in terms of some grant changes, we have realigned from teacher mentor salaries a 1.0 data support specialist to support the management of our employee evaluations and the analysis of that data. Um, every year, our supervisors evaluate um, five or 6,000 of our employees, and we need to manage that and know what that um, means. And this is a very important uh, realignment. In terms of rate changes, there is an increase in tuition reimbursement. Um, of $510,000. Uh, we were able uh, to find some efficiencies for operational efficiencies, looking at our travel and our program supplies, and um, um, I think that's gonna be fine for, uh, for our budget. That said, um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Um, just remind our my colleagues about the appendix, which has uh, additional details for every slide. Um, so back to my question from the last chapter about staying competitive in the region. Um, I, I see that you have realigned a position so that you can, um, for the substitute staffing, because obviously that is a critical role and that we have seen some strain in our system this year with trying to recruit enough subs um, and having our teachers have their planning periods instead of having to cover, cover for um, substitutes. Um, so one substitute teacher staffing specialist will do what? Could you elaborate on that? Well, we have two people on that team. It's the um, um, scope of this. We were, have been able to hire over 600 subs since um, the beginning of the school year, since July 1st. We actually have um, over 2,000 substitutes in our um, uh, 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 that's um, um, schools can, can use that have uh, been trained and, and passed our compliance. Our problem is sometimes that um, people only take one or two jobs um, and they want to sub near their home. They, you know, there's a, a lot of reasons. So this will allow us to um, hire more, hold more orientations, go out and really support and recruit. Uh, one of the things that we're trying to do with one of our schools uh, is to have um, a, a little substitute fair at that school, trying to garner some parents from that school because um, they really are down subs. We look at our sub rate every day. Uh, it is about 60 to 65 percent. Sometimes on Fridays it's about 50 percent. And this is an impact um, for each of the schools. But, uh, you know, in actuality, we have enough subs uh, in our sub pool. Uh, we need to try to understand the root causes about why they're not taking jobs. 
Okay, so I guess maybe that's related to my next question, similar to the bus driver question. What do you think, based on your experience, would attract more subs to yeah. take those longer-term assignments or more frequently? Right. Well, uh, we are fortunate in that our, we do our, our subs do get training, and we do try to provide them with uh, uh, the opportunity to, um, especially our long-term subs who are in the schools, to get the same kind of training that our, that our teachers get. Um, I think that our permanent sub program which we have expanded this year and uh, going to continue to expand is the way to go. And this uh, is um, subs that um, are assigned to schools every day. And uh, so they uh, come to the school, they become really part of the um, um, staff at that school. And so some days they may be in a high school teaching English or other days, social studies, and we assign those subs based on the needs of the school and uh, the number of um, sub vacancies that they, they may have. I think as we ex expand that and uh, those subs do get long-term sub pay, so um, that is an incentive for them as well. Yes, I've heard very good things about that, uh, that, that sub that schools can count on uh, day in and day out. Um, similar question to the bus drivers, what is our rate of pay for a substitute that just does a yeah. I knew you were going to ask me that, but <laughs> I think our long-term sub uh, pay rate is $145 a day, but I will uh, clarify that. I will get you that information. 145 may be long-term, and then yeah. what is the regular? It would be less than that, and we also do give um, uh, credit if you are uh, a certified teacher. Um, or if you have a four-year degree as well. So interested, but I will get that. Interested information. in those numbers, and again, the surrounding counties and yeah. districts. Yeah. I think we've always been pretty high and pretty competitive with the surrounding counties, but I certainly will check that and get that to you. Ms. Harris? Uh, yeah, just following that up, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to see you talking about long-term subs actually getting training, but I, I mean, I have... I'm wondering how intentionally we are being in reaching out to our substitute teachers and to our long-term subs and asking them what their experience is like in their schools and what would make their experience better. Because I have talked to some subs this year, long-term subs particularly, who did not have good experiences, had to fight to get training they needed to deliver, for instance, the elementary uh, math curriculum or classroom management. And so, I mean, are we, I mean, I think if we want to know why people aren't taking these jobs, we need to ask the people who've actually been in the trenches and then why they're not coming back. So I would encourage us, if we're not doing that, to just do a statistical analysis, just reach out randomly and just poll these teachers in a way that feels safe to them to get their honest experience. I think it's uh, a, a really good idea. I think we do it in a very informal way when people tell us why they're they're leaving and that, and I think we uh, doing it in a more formal way would be great. And then the other question I had, so looking in the appendix, and you were talking about that you've converted a position to a full-time uh, person to work on university partnerships around to support the career pathways, which is great. Um, but I'm wondering if we're doing anything intentional to create positions that work on our internal grow our own. And when I say grow our own, I'm talking about the students sitting in the classrooms right now and encouraging them to see us as a future employer. Do we have any people that are working on that specifically? Yes, one, one of our recruitment coordinators is really, that's, that's her job uh, around uh, increasing the number of our students who are going to be going into teaching and really working with universities around uh, developing some uh, really uh, unique and innovative impro uh, programs. We actually, and we'll pro highlight this on, and on uh, February 7th when we're here at the table as well, we're uh, working with Bowie State around um, um, maybe first time college goers or uh, other of our students going to Bowie State, <coughs> studying what they want you know, not necessarily going into education, but if they want to go into criminology or security or 
business or whatever, but they also come out with secondary certification in that content area. And then come back to Montgomery County, and we have, as I said, over 500 different kinds of positions. We have a job for everyone. And so they can come back and work in our finance department, work in our security department, or become teachers as well. And we want to give them the opportunity to um, study what their interests are and um, give them, uh, you know, several kinds of pathways to do that. Good, because I, I mean, we've been talking about that for a couple years and it, helping students to see the breadth of, of the, our workforce, which is not just teachers in the classroom, as important as they are, and paraeducators as important as they are. But um, So I'm glad to see that. I'd like to see some of that more intentionally, because I still talk to so many students who have, um, who aren't being encouraged to think of us in that way, so. With, uh, uh, with um, our LEADS grant, uh, 12 <coughs> students um, uh, were awarded um, scholarships last year, and I'm happy to say that money is finally getting to them uh, from the LEADS grant, and we are, uh, our goal is to actually double that this year, as well as um, provide other options for students across the, the district. Thank you. Mrs. Majeski. Yep, thank you. A um, couple of quick questions. Um, Tuition reimbursement, um, do we do any um, tuition reimbursement for um, independent professional development type of things? So um, we spoke with a, um, a journalism um, teacher yesterday and um, she was saying that, you know, we don't offer um, professional development in that area and um, things like that. But so she had to um, pay for coursework herself because it wasn't accredited. Do we, have we considered looking, in other words, it wasn't credit bearing, it wasn't a credit bearing course? Now, uh, we allow for past fail courses. We would have to look at that in terms of uh, if it's something that is needed so they can perform the duties of their, their position. Uh, if it's something around uh, building their capacity um, uh, yeah, and it didn't have to do with, um, you know, uh, courses that they have to take for recertification or something like that, it may not come under the uh, requirements for tuition reimbursement. There may be other ways that that uh, person could get some uh, stipend through the school or something like that. But we try to be as flexible as we can. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for example, we know that some of our arts teachers need certain kinds of um, uh, capacity building or additional kinds of certification. So, um, you know, it, it, you know, certainly if you're in a program for a master's or something like that or a doctorate, that that's a little bit easier. But we do try to look at every request and be as flexible as we can. Okay. We we spend over f uh, about four point nine million dollars for our uh, uh, employees in terms of uh, tuition reimbursement every year. I appreciate that. Um, I've also I've brought this up many times, but the uh, concept of um, us paying as opposed to reimbursing for people who don't have funds, whether it be to to pay for something like that up front, whether it be for you know, um, both our current employees and um, and that kind of um, reimbursement, tuition reimbursement aspect, but also for our students that are looking to attend college that can't pay. I don't know. I mean, again, I've talked about this a lot all over the years, but um, you know them paying uh, the school paying up front or MCBS paying up front, and then they work it work back the tuition essentially over the amount of years of service? 
Um, so uh, in terms of our current employees, we try to do direct pay whenever we can. Okay. So we have a program, um, that a partnership with Moreland State in South Carolina to support our conditionally certified teachers. And uh, it's a fast track to get them certified. And our agreement with Moreland State is that we direct pay so the teachers in that program who are conditionally certified and need to get their certification don't have to put out any money or and that. So w with some of our university partnerships, we try to do that. In terms of students, as we're looking to really grow our own mm -hmm. and really focus on um, our students, in terms of that, we we're uh, working with the universities around uh, different kinds of ways that it may be uh, funded through um, federal dollars and that. We certainly have our LEADS grant, which will give a step up to some of our students in some of these programs. Um, as we develop the um, um, MOUs with the universities, that is certainly something that we are working with. And in fact, on our planning team with uh, Bowie State, we do uh, have uh, their financial people on that team as we develop the MOU, and hopefully we'll have one by the end of the year. Okay, so even for with schools like universities at Shady Grove and stuff like that, we don't we don't do any of that kind of prepay for students. I mean, who want to go into teach it? I'm just trying to think, keeping kids local and making sure, sure. that they um, have the opportunity to come back. You know, I'll give you the same story. I always, you know, I was in a, I went to visit a uh, one of Liberty's promises. Um, programs, uh, after school programs, um, he saw a program and was asking the kids, you know, what do you want to be? And a couple of them said teacher. And I was like, oh, well, that's great. We're hiring them. We're like, oh, well, we can't afford to go to college, so we're not going to be able to do that. And then I'm like racking my brain as to, you know, state legislators, scholarships, blah, blah, you know, whatever. But school's expensive. And so I just would really, really, really like to see us work harder on partnerships with places like universities at Shady Grove um, where they could make a payback. It, it's not like it's a free, we're just paying for college, but um, where they would reduce the rate that they owe of each year that they, they work with us. So mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know. Yes, I just wanted to agree and, and reaffirm to you, Ms. Mandrowski, that is definitely something that we're working on. We're actually working on um, and we'll talk more about it later in an event that we want to have this fall, and it really is focused on how we are um, um, taking care of the scholarship monies for students going into these special areas like teaching and other areas within the educational space and working with local um, universities to do so. So I, I, I appreciate you bringing that up because for some of our students, um, it is a true reality. Um, how do I get funding up front? Right. If I don't have it, and we have to know who those students are, and put them in the programs that um, that take care of that. Not every student needs that, but for those students who do need it, we want them to know that we have options available to them. So, thank you for raising that. We look forward to coming back and talking more about that. And I think we also want to. Uh, make that pipeline one where uh, students may get summer jobs in Montgomery County mm -hmm. and really make that connection. And with our programs for students to encourage students to go into education and and that one of the key uh, parts of that is that they uh, the students in the programs have uh, mentors or people to check in with them. And uh, Cindy Pinkard, who uh, is our recruitment specialist in terms of uh, Grow Your Own, just checked in with the 12 students who uh, I think some of the board members celebrated them uh, last spring. And they're all in school and they're all on track to uh, become, to stay in education. And so that's an important part of those kinds of uh, programs and mm -hmm. relationships. Yeah, no, I, I do. I appreciate that. I also, the difference between like a scholarship and what I'm talking about, it, it ensures that other people stay here and work with us, and right. which would be huge. Um, yeah, right. Um, the I had a question about um, our reimagining our pay scale. You know, we hear a lot about um, how our pay scale works and whether or not it's 
consistent with the needs of our staff today as opposed to when it first was put into place. Um, so things like, I'm curious as to what it would cost, what would be the total cost of, if we can, if there's a way to know, in looking at redoing how we do our pay scale. So things like school psychologists potentially would be on a different pay scale. Um, areas that we, you know, are really struggling to recruit and find uh, people to fill the positions for, you know, some differentiated pay. Um, I've had a lot of conversations with different people from MCEA as well as, you know, some of the other unions. Um, retention concerns that we talk about, you know, is what would it look like financially for us if we were to able to agree to something, you know, where it was a, you know, zero to five years you work with us, you get X amount of dollars when you, you know, at the end of the year. Five to ten, you get a little less or half, and then... 10 plus, you get just a little bit. I don't know, I just, I, I'm not sure where we are with that whole kind of re-looking at um, those issues. Dr. Yes, okay. I, I was gonna say yes, definitely timely. Um, we, we've been working with our associations, I know specifically in naming out our teachers and looking at uh, the overall pay scale because that's a part of what we want to look at in mapping out the career ladder and the blueprint. Mm -hmm. So we will be able to come back and um, share more with you. Uh, Mr. Hull had mentioned that we are going to be working with having a um, consultant to actually work with us um, oh, that's to, actually, to yeah. actually do that. Because even our bus drivers have mentioned, you know, like while we've increased the starting pay, mm -hmm. a lot of them have been there for a while. Right. And how are we really That's exactly right. Um, yeah, and same thing in a, in a number of different spaces. So I know our associations have you know, been hearing from their members and taking all of those things into consideration so that when we, you know, come to the table, we, we take all of that. Because things have changed, particularly for the starting salary blueprint for teachers and all of that. And we've got to address it from beginning to end. Yep. Thank you. Ms. Rivera Alvin. Thank you. <laughs> I just want to uh, piggyback on what Ms. Harris was talking about, um, checking in with um, our long-term subs and our subs. You mentioned that since uh, the beginning of the school year, we have hired over 400, about 400 uh, of them. I have 600. Oh, oh, that's even, okay. So you do have a very robust pool where you can actually uh, get this information. Um, and my other question was, how many of those are in the long-term um, pathway? out of the 600, um, and just curious to know what kind of training support they, they actually get, and just the demographics of them as well. Sure. Um, and uh, going back to also something uh, about growing our own, just curious to know that, you know, I'm a huge supporter that we grow our own for teachers and so on, but as we know, not every student is going in those kind of pathways and we want to support alternative careers. So we have all these incredible programs right now in Seneca Valley and other schools. So how deliberate are we making sure that those students are connected to opportunities for HVAC, for electricians, for uh, uh, mechanics, you know, how, you know, because um, it just sounds like one person for the whole system seems like, you know, we have 160,554 students. So it sounds like, it's, to me at least, it's not enough. So I'm just wondering how we are putting that connectivity with those students as well. So uh, this is where uh, you want to get cross-office collaboration and, you know, the people in curriculum and instruction and, and that. Actually, this past summer at summer school graduation, uh, our team went over uh, to uh, see if anybody would be interested in, in applying for any of our job openings from summer school as a bridge to some of the things that they might be doing post-graduation. So, um, you know, I do think it, it really is that there are a lot of things that are going on and, um, you know, HR would, uh, you know, certainly partner with a lot of the academic programs around uh, uh, certification that students are getting in technology and other kinds of things. We also, when we uh, when we do hire people into MCPS, we do have our supporting services career pathway, uh, which um, the board supports.
reported last year as an accelerator. And uh, we uh, just had a celebration of the mentors in that program that are mentoring other support staff to say that, you know, here are some pathways. Uh, you may have come in as a bus driver, although we do want to keep our bus drivers, but we also want them to know that they can have a career in Montgomery County doing other other things, and these are the kinds of uh, ways that you can become uh, maybe an IT person or something like that. Dr. McKnight? Yes, I was just going to say I think this is something that we should we should bring back um, because we were just having the conversation in the operations presentation about how we get students prepared for a workforce. Um, within Montgomery County in those um, plant operations areas and, and spaces. We know we're doing the same around teaching, which is where our academic department is is involved. Um, bless you. Uh, so I, when I think about HR, they're really the hub in the midst of all of these offices to do it. But because it's so directly related to us building the future of uh, the school system and with our out of school time and other initiatives like that, the goal is to be able to have students um, again, do those apprenticeships and internships, and they can do them right here. <laughs> uh, they can do them right here. So I think that's something that we should, we can bring back to the board just to share the overall vision for it, because I said it last night in one of our um, community forums, but every position that we need within the school system, they're already here, they're just sitting in our classrooms, and there are 161,000 of them. Um, Dr. McKnight, you will have that opportunity at our next board meeting on February 7th. <laughs> it will be a very packed board meeting, but HR plan is one of the topics for the next okay. board meeting. HR hiring plan slash focus on diversity in leadership, including update on the implementation of Grow Your Own with our high school students and with support personnel. As you heard, this is of huge interest to the board. It's of huge importance to our school system because if we don't have staff, fully staffed schools with high quality educators, we cannot fulfill our mission. So at that meeting, we hope to hear all the details, outcomes of your efforts. We hear a lot about we're working on it, we're working on it, we're working on it. Of course, I understand everything takes a lot of work to accomplish, but we want to hear some outcomes. How many students do you have in the pipeline? How many students do you expect at that graduation this spring? Um, how, you know, uh, I mentor students. I know it's hard to get into the system. What are we doing about that to make it easier? So great opportunity for a great conversation in just two weeks. Ms. Yang. Yes, thank you. Thank you for, the, uh, for sharing. So the, you mentioned best people get the best results, completely agree. So professional development is uh, a must uh, have for our um, employees. Now I want to make a comment about tuition reimbursement. In our school system, there are some elective courses that ha we have fewer employees. Um, uh, courses like the journalism that's mentioned, or personal finance, astronomy, anatomy, physiology, you can name it. A lot of elective courses that are a smaller set of employee, not necessarily has a certification in that area. They can be a science teacher, they can be a math teacher teaching those courses. So a lot of those trainings might not be credit bearing, but it's essential tools to help them to be better teachers with the content areas and classroom uh, management. So I would like to stress that those are the two things that we need to look at uh, for tuition reimbursement. Those are direct investment in them being effective teachers. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Yang. Ms. Wolf? I think Mr. Kim had his light on first. You can go ahead. Mr. Kim? Yeah, thank you. Um, no, I'm not ready. <laughs> I got it, I got it. Um, so I, I, you know, there's certainly a lot of, I, I just had one thing I wanted to raise. There's certainly a lot of intersection with some of the chapters we've discussed previously of the budget, um, but I thought I'd raise it here. Um, I recently had the chance to speak with a teacher uh, and she raised um, the idea of 
providing a stipend uh, for teachers to provide tutoring services. Um, and, and I'm of the philosophy that you can never have too many academic supports for students. Uh, and this could be something, you know, an, an opportunity for teachers certainly um, to, to, to receive that stipend and also leverage their expertise uh, in serving our students. Uh, so I just wanted to ask if this is something that's been considered at all. Um, just wanted to raise that. That's part of our tutoring program. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, I'm glad uh, to, to be able to bring that back. Thank you. Ms. Wolf? My question is around subs, just something I think we might want to con consider. I was listening to some teachers talk last night, and we know that some of our schools are even more difficult to get subs in than, than others. And so I, I think that we might want to think about as we are doing salary, setting salaries, providing even an extra layer, particularly around special needs schools. That's it. Yes, I am a big supporter of that, uh, Ms. Wolf. Okay, uh, Mrs. Madrowski. Yep, sorry, thanks. Um, in reference to the fully staffed schools, I know that we have money in our current budget even um, for positions that we haven't been able to fill. Um, so in other words, you know, money we allocated to have a certain number of counselors, may whatever it might be. Um, with those positions not being filled, the funding is essentially still there. I guess it gets moved to our fund balance or I'm not 100% sure, but um, I'm wondering is, have, are we able to, or have we considered um, using any of those funds in order to entice people to come um, and work with us now? Yeah, I can speak to that, thank you. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, we actually account for the vacancy and turnover. You know, in a district this large, there's always gonna be unfilled positions and there's turnover throughout the year. And so uh, what the finance team does is they look at that, you know, from a historical perspective and current unfilled positions, and then they estimate each year during the budget process as to what that amount is going to be. And so the amount that we included in the, uh, the budget that we're looking at now is approximately $40 million that we think there's going to be in the FY24 school year of those savings. And so we back that out, and so then we're actually able to strategically budget those dollars. Uh, and so that's what's included in the budget that you're seeing now. And so those those dollars, in essence, are already accounted for. Oh, OK. Because we're on the assumption that we will not be able to fill those positions? We just know, you know, in a system this large that we're never able to fill all of the positions all of the time. Okay, I mean, I get that. I just, I'm not trying to push back. I just, um, it just seems like if we're looking for ways of enticing more people to come, that that might be a better use of those dollars. I was curious about the um, the consultant that you mentioned. Um, do you like? Do we know roughly what something like that would cost? And are there systems doing things around us that we could look at as well? Yep. Um, so as far as the uh, the vacancy and turnover piece, that would just have to be accounted for and put into the budget on the front end as a is a budget item. If we wanted to, you know, allocate ten or twenty million dollars for that, we certainly could. It, it's just the trade off because then there's ten or twenty million of something that's currently in there that would have to come out. So that would just be, uh, you know, a trade off as part of our operations. Um, as far as the, and I'll let Dr. Mark speak a little bit more to this. As far as the um, consultant that we're looking at, we're in the process of issuing an RFP now. Uh, and so what we want to do is in collaboration with our associations, and I see Ms. Martin sitting in the, in the audience here, is just bring in some uh, expertise from a company or a, you know a consulting group that has done this around the country. And so part of this, the idea is really bringing in best practices from around the country and seeing what other districts are doing, uh, what has been effective, what the interests of our employees are, and really working together to uh, develop a new system uh, that will, you know, meet those needs uh, well into the future. And so I'll stop there and turn it over. Yeah, well, I, I think that's it. And uh, we have a very traditional um, uh, salary schedule for our, our teachers at Steps and Lanes. Uh, the, uh, our union partners have um, ideas uh, and about how to look at that salary schedule, and uh, we're going to be working together around uh, completing that RFP and 
and uh, getting it out on the street and uh, hopefully be able to look at that um, uh, over the summer for our uh, next, uh, next budget. Okay, my last question is, um, what efficiencies in our budget, I wrote this one down because I've been, uh, what efficiencies in our budget can we expect to see based on the new data systems that we've purchased over time? And when will they be up and running? And particularly, or more, most particularly, the business information system that we've been working on for years? Yeah, I can address that. So, Seems that um, right. Moving end date consistently. So it is a, it's a long project because we started this a couple years ago, right, when we looked at our ERP or the financial system. Uh, then we went on to the budget system and now we're uh, concluding with our HCM or human capital management system. So we do plan on seeing efficiencies later on. Right now we're in the midst of it. Um, I'm talking a couple years down the road because um, some, some of the, uh, it's, it's the learning the new system, it's training on the new system and um, but to answer your question, there will be efficiencies. There will be a um, something down the road. But right now, we're we're learning about the system and implementing it. So I, I couldn't give you a dollar amount right now. What the that Obviously, budget savings I guess would until be? But it's would going, maybe we won't really know. I, I think I'm more concerned with the fact that we still are doing paper time cards and um, and we can't give our. 10-month employees the option to get 12-month paycheck. Yeah, well, those I felt like be... that was low-hanging fruit years ago, but it, here we are. <laughs> yeah, those will be two efficiencies that will be addressed as soon as this HEM project is finished. I thought you were talking about other efficiencies of savings once those projects are kind of implemented. I don't know if you want to say, I just... No, I was going to say uh, time and attendance and more flexibility uh, in uh, that payroll paper system are part of the specifications for the human capital management system. Also, after that, particularly to human resources, uh, we're looking for a new uh, applicant tracking system that hopefully will streamline our application process. We know that it's sometimes cumbersome. We also are trying to, in the interim, streamline ways that our retirees can apply uh, for positions because we really use them and, and need their expertise as well as um, people returning to MCPS mm -hmm. who, who left for a number of reasons but are in good stead. And so internally, we are trying to streamline that process to make it easier for um, those people to apply or reapply again. Just seems like we've been working on all of those things for a really long time. It would be great if we could figure out how to get it going. Ms. Evans? I've turned my light on, off and on several times um, because some of my questions have been answered as well as I did remember prior to Ms. Silvestri um, commenting on you're going to come before us on February the 7th, mm -hmm. but it's really hard to have you sit in front of us and not ask any questions that might be related to um, that conversation on February the 7th. But I'll start off by saying you mentioned um, at the very start of your presentation that you had the smallest budget um, out of all the offices and you do like the most important job here in MCPS, which is hiring, you know, everyone that works in the system to either stand in front of our, our students or just support the work. So um, I hope that means nothing um, in regards to the work that you have to do with having the smallest budget. But you mentioned earlier, and I, was, and I remember this as well, that um, the board put an accelerator in the budget last year for career pathways. So um, the question I did come up with was, um, how are we able to, or have we been able to work with um, particularly SEIU in trying to um, see uh, Ms. Edwards, you know, gave a really great um, explanation or an example of what they're doing around transportation. Are you able to see some movement, like particularly like around our paraeducators with being able to help um, move in a direction that would we be able to better utilize them in the areas of filling in um, for in staff shortages, like for substitutes? So. Are we moving people from um, positions of um, SEIU to possibly in our teaching roles? Have we been able to see some strides in that area? 
Um, we haven't really planned to give you an update on the career pathways on the seventh. You know, one of the things about HR, there is so much. Yes. It's not just hiring and onboarding people, but it's all that back-end stuff. But uh, maybe we can uh, adjust uh, some of that and uh, talk about how we are mentoring uh, our SEIU employees, particularly in the areas of, um, of maintenance and, and building services and some of those others, to uh, talk about what that mentoring is and uh, how we see there might be movements for uh, the employees to apply for other so positions. If it's not a heavy lift, if you could do that, I would really appreciate it. Only because, you know, as we're talking about the budget, you know, the community hears us um, and hears all of our employees talking about um, the pay, right? Um, but some of it is even if we pay our employees um, a higher salary or higher amount, some of the issues that we're seeing will still exist, right? So we want to show our community how we're working to um, try to make some changes to the state that we're in as a result of um, the pandemic, right? Um, many people are moving out of the positions, right? While we want them to stay, what is the work that we're doing to try to um, keep the employees that are currently here here and then have them move into um, another career pathway, right? Because we talk about that. But I would like for people to be able to see the work that's happening um, or at least the movement or the direction that we're trying to go in to move people um, in these various positions. I know there was one school that I visited and the principal talked about um, someone in the supporting staff area that wanted to move up and how they were working with that staff member, trying to be creative to support them in trying to go to school or trying to get the certification and then still make time to um, have gainful employment in our school system. So anything that you can provide to the community, that would be great. And I know it's not related to the budget, but it is. You know, I, I just want our, because we talk. So for, just for clarification, is this a follow-up for today or do you want it as a No, this is not a follow-up. It's not a follow-up. I, I thought Dr. Marks understood that I, I asked if it wasn't a heavy lift, and because I know it's coming up soon to try to add something in there to kind of show okay. the work that's happening. Okay. Yep. And it is, it is grow your own in a sense. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. Um, uh, a, a couple of points, and I, I thank you. Um, uh, saying that we have the smallest budget is not saying that we definitely need 20 more people. It is about the right work and the strategic work about recruitment and hiring. So um, are we are we doing that in the right way? And so one of the things we look at is what is our return on investment from our recruitment? And we want to be really strategic. It's not that, um, you know, clearly in terms of our accelerators that you'll see, we are looking at how we can serve our employees better around some of the services that we provide. You know, we provide classification, we look at classification, um, we have fingerprinting, we have certification, we have a lot of back end things in HR. Um, so uh, we are always looking at, are we doing the, you know, the right work? And then um, we do know that our SEIU partners do not use tuition reimbursement as much as some of our other employees, so maybe we have to mark Market that better, sure. uh, so our SEIU employees know that that is a benefit for them. Absolutely, and I do see where we're going to have fingerprinting in-house, and mm -hmm. we're not going to be doing that externally. And that there is um, some a position that's going to help with the recruitment and retention of administrators, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yep. 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 So no, I I know that you're doing the work that we need you to do, um, but we do want to ensure if if um, you need positions to higher that that's there as well. Thank you. Ms. Harris. Yeah, quick follow-up and just feel free to let me know if this is coming attractions or uh, should be discussed um, in another section, but uh, an issue that came up uh, last year looking at, and you know me, I'm always looking at common sense, pragmatic ways to you know, get the work done more efficiently. Um, some of our school administrators raised the issue that when we look at summer school, local programs, there's a, a 
a, a system of hiring for the programs that is multiple layers of redundant bureaucracy, making you know s teachers and staff at that school who intend to teach in the summer program reapply for their jobs to teach in summer school, which is just you know again it, their their point was it's frustrating, it's it's again redundant and did. Are we looking at, as we're talking about efficiencies, is anything like that in the works to to um, reduce that that the paperwork piece uh, when staff want to teach in their own school summer programs? And and certainly whenever we can, uh, I am uh, totally in support of that. I I would have to you know, uh, look into exactly what the uh, issues have been, and we certainly want to make sure that we're following all our um, procedures and processes in our uh, negotiated agreements around uh, access and um, advertising positions and everything like that, but certainly we'll look at that. The We know from research, if you make it easy for people to apply and get hired, They've already made that commitment to your district, so we certainly want to streamline as much as we can. I'm happy to put you in touch with some of the uh, administrators who laid the issue out very concretely. Yeah. Um, Dr. McKnight. Thank you. Um, I, I would recommend that we normally bring in a presentation from the Office of Curriculum Instruction to showcase preparation for the summer school program, that we add this on as uh, an update to share how we are addressing and alleviate those uh, situations shared by staff. Thank you, because I, I, th I think I heard also from um, special education hiring for their summer services program that they had some struggles with um, hiring. So thank you for that. My final question before we are going to break, because it's almost noon, um, is around consulting teachers. So we've heard from parents that there's a teacher in the classroom, but maybe that's not their area of expertise. And so I'm um, concerned or, or wondering about the support that those teachers, the new teachers are getting in general, but also the teachers that are maybe uh, new to the system, maybe are not teaching in their field of expertise. Um, and so what, um, can you please remind me what the consulting teacher ratio is? How many uh, new teachers do they have on their caseload? I imagine that it, if I'm a new teacher that is teaching a field that's not my expertise, I'm going to need a lot more help than uh, a teacher that is just new to MCPS but has the training. And so that's more work. And so I thought I'm concerned about that while we're 99% staff, the consulting teachers are having to um, do more work to prepare those teachers to deliver the, the best services for our students. Uh, I'm going to ask Dr. Stanislav to come to the table. And as she's coming, uh, the, uh, Dr. Yolanda Stanislav is our director of the professional growth systems and consulting teachers and principals are under uh, her supervision. We do try to match content area to content area whenever we can, but um, she can uh, tell you more specifically. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, thank you for that question. We currently have um, 29 uh, consulting teachers and two of them, actually 31 consulting teachers and two of them serve as the co-leads. Um, they, in general, we have a ratio of about 1 to 20, a 1 to 22 um, regarding the consulting teachers. So we're supporting um, over about 575 uh, teachers in the district. And the support does look different. Um, depending on if an individual has come into our district and they're fully certified uh, in the area, and if they are, um, you know, ready to go, they've just graduated from whichever one of our partnership uh, schools and, and they're in, in, their, in their classes. Then we have those uh, 
teachers who are new to the profession, maybe change of career, uh, and they do require more support. So we often say that the support that we give to those new teachers is maybe 50% more than what we would normally give, um, thus increasing the amount of time. It's maybe not um, a quantitative value of 1 to 22, but it feels higher uh, because of the work that they're doing. So, uh, not, so we have that, but we also offer our new teachers a litany, and we will actually share some of that in um, the board meeting on the 7th, um, a litany of, of professional learning opportunities uh, just designed for them, the new teacher training courses. We have about three grants going right now that are designed to support new teachers and new teachers who um, have had some training experience and those that have not. So um, we do have programs in place. We, Of course, we have our consulting teachers. Also, you, you asked about the certification component um, of that. So we do have consulting teachers who have multiple certifications, or uh, if they are supporting uh, someone out of area, we have the, the cohort is able to support one another. So if, if it's um, a science high school person and the, the consulting teacher may not have that particular certification, it's more so looking at the pedagogy and the work they're doing regarding teaching and learning. And if there's some specificity that we need to um, collaborate around regarding science in particular, then we have individuals on our, um, in our department who would be able to support that one individual. So long-term subs have access to that support? Long-term subs do not have access to a consulting teacher. Hmm. And it's designed for, for, I'm sorry, it's designed for first-year teachers uh, and teachers who are uh, underperforming. The training either? The training, we have, we do have uh, that program that um, we are currently getting in place regarding substitute teacher training. We did offer through the Life After Zoom grant that we have um, some training for sub substitute teachers, but most of those grants are geared towards supporting uh, teachers, first year teachers, some veteran teachers, and support professionals. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Long-term subs would be uh, getting support from their team leaders um, and department chairs and um, participating in uh, the same type of training that uh, the classroom teacher is um, uh, participating in because they were there basically as the teacher of record because they're a long-term sub. So the, the caseload is uh, 20 to 22 per consultant. Yeah, that's high. That's, is that, what's the best practice? Mm -hmm. Ratio. So um, the the program was originally designed 20 years ago um, with the best practice ratio a little closer to one to 16 ish. Um, however, you know over the years uh, it's grown a bit, um, but we do have the supports that we layer in place regarding the training for our consulting teachers to be able to support with that differentiated number. It's a little higher than um, what it was current. What would, it was originally designed to be. Thank you. And, and if I may, we have uh, different kinds of people coming into teaching. So we have many more career changers. We have people coming from alternative programs, from your um, general uh, education, your traditional educational prep programs. So um, the consulting uh, teachers who are marvelous and really a key to. Uh, retention of our teachers because uh, they, our teachers get a lot of one-on-one, -on -one, uh, do need to provide differentiated services for who is coming into teaching. Makes sense. Thank you. Mrs. Madrowski? Yeah, I, I was going to ask a question about directors, but I'm wondering now if it might be better served at the board meeting. But um, so maybe I'll hold off on it. The, that aspect of it now, but for clarification, can you tell me what it would cost um, to add one or, or two or three more directors, um, maybe just do one so that, and then I can add, look at the m number multiples of that, and also um, what an additional consulting teacher would cost? Thank you. Yes, Harris? Uh, quick follow up, Dr. Stanislaus. Um, so appreciate the supports we give for new teachers. I was one. 
Um, I had a consulting teacher. I had to ask for it, but um, he was wonderful. And um, But the one thing that I would observe is I don't think, and correct me if I'm wrong, that we have in our system any situation in which CTE educators are serving as consulting teachers to, to CTE mm -hmm. educators or people who were CTE educators supervising those content areas inside central office. And I think that's a, something that we need to look at because it really is, it's not general education, it's a completely different animal. And um, I think having some CTE, and you want to talk about people coming from outside, people are coming from outside from a whole different experience level to teach a whole different content area. And so um, if we do have some former CTE educators in that role, that, that would be I would love to hear that, but um, if we don't, I think that's something we should look at intentionally, just an observation. Absolutely. I'll, um, we're a part of the work that we do in order to ensure that um, we, you know, uh, comport with with the whole operations of the professional world systems, we have our implementation team. So what I can do is definitely bring that back to our teacher implementation team and also look at the data that we currently have. Um, and I'll gladly share that with you as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, as we have been asking follow-ups uh, this today, I'm reminded that our follow-up binder has been distributed. Uh, Ms. Roberta Oven has hers there, and so make sure you have you check in your mailbox and reviewing the follow-ups from the hearing. I'm guessing that's in there for now. Great, great thank you. So we're going to take a 15-minute break, and um, we are behind schedule, so we'll have to incorporate the finance chapter into the afternoon. Uh, it's jam-packed, but um, enjoy your break.
Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we are ready to continue with the second half of our presentation of our final work session for today. And with that, I hand it over to Dr. McKnight. Thank you, President Silvestri. Our next item is Chapter 9, Finance. I'll turn it over to um, Mr. Riley. All righty. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so I'm, I'm looking at this slide, and actually we're a close second. Uh, Dr. Marks was mentioned, she's the smallest. We're, we're pretty close there. But if you look at the footnote, I'll, I'll get into that a little later. But um, So to start, the mission of the Office of Finance is to facilitate the alignment of district priorities with financial resources that result in MCPS providing the highest quality education and opportunities for all students to succeed. Um, but before going over the budget, I'm going to provide you with a brief overview of the Office of Finance annual cycle. So the process starts with the division of management and budget where uh, the office promotes racial equality and social justice by supporting MCPS leadership and the board in the formulation, submission, and implementation of the annual MCPS operating budget. Equitable teaching and learning is accomplished in part through equity in the allocation of resources. The school and financial operations teams work works closely with all MCPS offices to implement guidelines to allocate resources to schools based on school, student, and program requirements. The team collaborates with stakeholders to ensure that these guidelines uh, uh, align with district priorities and are differentiated to meet student needs. The allocations for staff as well as materials are consistent so that schools with similar needs receive similar resources, but allocations are also differentiated, differentiated so that schools with greater needs receive greater resources. Um, it is also key that allocations are flexible and transparent. Uh, and so I made a note to myself, I, I know uh, some of you probably say, hey, we haven't changed these formulas in many, many years. Um, so that's why I wanted to bring up the flexible and, and address uh, Mrs. Uh, Wolf's question from before. So with regard to security assistance, uh, the way we allocate that is by school type, student enrollment, and square footage. They're the primary quantifiable factors, uh, but in determining the allocation, we also look at serious incident data and special programs. Uh, so part of this process, too, is when we do our staffing retreats. So this is where the directors um, and, and my uh, supervisor goes over the staffing formulas uh, with the associates as well, too. So there is flexibility there. I think the, the question came up last time. If somebody's at like 599 enrollment, do we just kind of put them below? But it, it's kind of a joint process. Um, Can I just interrupt you and yeah, sure. ask you? at some later date, not today, if you could provide me with a, a breakdown by school of how many security assistants each one has. Yes, Thank you. definitely, yes. Um, so I just wanted to bring that up, that uh, you know we do have some flexibility uh, you know, when, when needed. Um, so the Division of Procurement supports the Office of Finance by working closely with all offices, departments, and the Office of General Counsel to provide contracts for schools and offices to purchase high-quality goods and services at reasonable cost. And uh, Ms. Edwards mentioned before, so we did move procurement uh, from operations until uh, into the Office of Finance. Uh, we felt it was a better fit, because you can see here, there's a lot of collaboration within the Office of Finance with procurement, um, and that's the reason I'll get into some other other, uh, factors later. So once those contracts and purchase orders are in place, the Division of Controller works with offices to ensure that vendor contracts and all invoices in the system are paid timely and accurately. This division also makes sure that monies owed to MCPS are billed and collected as well. The division works closely with procurement to manage the PCARD program and works with the Division of Management and Budget to make sure timely and accurate financial data and reports are available to make sound budget and financial decisions throughout the year. The Office of Finance also works year-round to make sure schools have financial support through the work of the Visiting Bookkeeper Program and to make sure all schools and offices receive timely financial training and the, this office also uh, updates the financial manual so that there's a resource for all the various financial functions in the system. The Employee and Retiree Services Department also works throughout the year as the single point of contact for employees and retirees for information about compensation and benefits. They ensure that all employees are paid accurately and promptly in accordance with all federal, state, and local regulations and contractual mandates. This department also implements uh, the benefit plan provisions for over 50,000 covered individuals and manage the, um, manages the MCPS Employee Wellness Program. 
The Division of Investments also plays a key role in managing benefits by overseeing the over $2 billion MCPS Employees Retirement and Pension Fund, as well as the 403B and 457 Divine Contribution Plans. The Division of Final Financial Services completes the annual cycle by preparing the annual comprehensive financial reports and oversees the annual external audit of those statements that cover all of our 10 distinct funds. <coughs> Uh, so when you take a look at the pie chart above, I want to point out that uh, all the financial activities I just described, as well as many other compliance functions not mentioned, uh, we do this with less than 100 uh, full-time employees with total position salaries of approximately 8.5 million. Uh, if you see up there, it's actually 14.2, and the difference is attributed to the provision for future supported projects. So this provision represents a lump sum appropriation that allows the board under certain conditions to approve the receipt and expenditure of unanticipated grant funds. You'll see this in the board meetings and as a consent item, item there. Um, rather than having to request supplemental appropriations from the county council. The amounts of contractual services, supplies, and equipment on the chart are mostly related to those future grants. Uh, we do have one or two uh, contractual services for actuarial services. Um, another unique feature of the Office of Finance budget is that it also holds all of the funding for our employee benefits in the amount of approximately $650 million, and that you can uh, see in the bottom footnote there. Uh, the main components of that $650 million are $330 million for health benefits, $150 million for pension, and $165 million for FICA and workers' compensation. Next slide, please. So when we talk about realignments, um, as, as we've mentioned before, these are uh, cost neutral. So the, each of the divisions are looking at uh, funds that they have within their department, either vacancies or um, extra funds that they haven't used. Um, and we, we try to fit the needs of the current needs of that division. So in the division of management and budget, uh, we are looking to uh, move a, a 1.0 supervisor position with some non-position funds to realign to a 1.0 director position. And this is because the division requires a high level of leadership. Uh, as you all know, we're, we're moving into, or we're gonna be moving into a pro, uh, program budget. There's also a lot more blueprint uh, reporting for grants that, that's come about over the last year. Uh, in the division of controller, uh, we're, we're moving a, an account assistant position to a, a accounts team leader position due to the needs in that division. As for employee and retiree services, we're gonna uh, move a, a 1.0 payroll specialist position to a data integration specialist two position. Um, we're not taking away from payroll because the uh, data integration specialist is actually gonna support the payroll function, just at a higher level. And then finally, the division of procurement. Um, so this one, we actually have a decrease. Uh, there's a 1.0 materials management support position and a 1.0 materials property assistant. Um, that's gonna be realigned to chapter seven. When we did do the reorganization, we realized that uh, most of the, the FTEs within that, that division uh, were finance related, but these, these two particular positions were more related to um, operations. Um, as for grants and, and uh, grant shifts, so there is an increase of 1.5 million for that provision for future supported projects, and that's based on the actual expenditures and the anticipation of more grant funds coming in FY 2024. We had been for many years at about $10 million, now we're bumping it up to 11.5 million. And as I said, it, it's kind of a, a, a method to just uh, make you know, if, if it's a recurring grant, uh, we just are adding some appropriation. The county allows us that that opportunity. Um, and now these other areas, so growth and new school, where it says employee and retiree service centers, what that represents is the um, the uh, increase in benefits for the positions that were related that we talked about previous in previous work session. So growth was 238 positions. These are the benefits related to that. And 57.94 positions in new schools, that's the benefits for that. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so rate change and others. So I, I had alluded in the beginning of this presentation that uh, operations had a lot of rate changes and in inflation as well as um, Finance. So in this one, we're in for the uh, 26 million dollars. We're increasing 4.2 million for the district share of employee health benefit, and that's resulting from projected health care rate increases. We're also increasing 15 million dollars to support the increases in medical and prescription drug costs. And finally, we're increasing 6.8 million for the Board of Education share of the Maryland Retirement and Pension System because the rate increased from 4.17 to 5. 
0.12. Uh, finally, efficiencies, uh, for the most part, these are just uh, bank fee reductions, but uh, as I noted before, um, uh, we, we also deal with benefits here. So the part of it is also the employee benefits related to the, the six FTEs that uh, were part of the, the reductions. And that, if you recall, these are vacant positions, but these are the associated benefits with those positions. Uh, so that, that should do it. So. I'd like to continue with the next chapter and then we'll ask all our finance and administration Thanks. questions together. And our presenter is, um, let me just check real quick here. I don't think he was quite ready. Okay. Any questions? I have a quick coming attraction based on Mr. Riley was talking about how <laughs> finance works around staffing allocations and things like that. So at our fiscal management committee meeting on January 30th, we will be doing a deep dive on the, the, the staffing allocation process, the timeline, the process, and how we are working to be more nimble and flexible as needs evolve in schools. So coming attractions, tune in Monday. Staffing allocations will be covered at, what's the date? Uh, January 30th, next Monday. Very important yeah. topic. Yeah. All right, sexiest committee. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Harris. I have, uh, thank you. I have a clarifying thing. So two things. I apologize for missing the last work session. So some of my questions. When I asked about the cost of the director, um, I don't know. I think I got it in my head about human resources because of the possible hiring aspect of it as opposed to I meant for um, under OSSI. Um, so trying to figure out so you know I've been have I've had several conversations with like even Dr. Jaffis and um, folks like that and <clears throat> kind of looking at the role of the directors and whether or not there might be ways that some of what they do could incorporate some of like the professional development aspects that I mean, I know they already do a lot of that, but there's, there's just, there's so um, many schools, and so we've got a lot of, um, you know, a lot of new principals, and um, so, you know, I'm just trying to make sure, if we're, see if we're using our resources to the best of our abilities, um, you know, in terms of supporting principals, schools, and even teachers, um, which is why I attached the consulting teacher aspect along with it, just to see, because as we grow in numbers of students, we have not grown in numbers of those things generally. And um, I know you, I know Dr. McKnight, you just did a redesign thing, but just in thinking about it, I was curious about if we added a director underneath, if they could take on some of the extra Right. professional growth stuff. So you are on the right track, um, Ms. Madrasi, that I'm going to say because if you think about the last few years in the system, we've made some structural organizational changes. The next level of the work that we need to do is how we are supporting our schools. Dr. Murphy and I actually are meeting with um, our folks this afternoon to actually talk about the vision of how we're going to do that together. And it really does come down looking at what resources do we have, current research around principal support and supervision, particularly in the space of instructional leadership, i.e. aligned to the data that we looked at yesterday and looking at what are going to be those specific uh, moves that we invest in in terms of how they go about their work. I think for the last few years there have been a lot of changes in terms of people but not really drilling into what is everyone doing and what, what is the conduit to their work to that impact on student learning. Um, so that's yeah. um, okay, good. coming attraction. Okay, because okay. um, like I said, so, yeah. I, so I just was hoping to get an estimate of what it would cost in case we need I, you know, considering adding it as a well, cost and benefit. I don't have it offhand, but I no, that's fine. Like, and, I, and I will say this: um, one thing that I've been trying to be, we all have been being very cognizant of is before we even tinker with people more, really hone in on what outcome do we want from what they're doing. Yep. Um, you know, we've we've been through a number of iterations of of staffing. Someone actually said it here earlier today. Um, Sometimes it goes even beyond the number of people, but zoning in on exactly what the uh, 
I also have that in my notes. The work is. Yeah, clarity so, about what the work is. Exactly, because just adding on, if there is not that clarity or that alignment specifically to how we support principals, looking yep. at how then they support teachers who support students in their learning, right. then just another individual will not shift that. So really focusing in on what does that work really look like, yep. and then studying it along with others to then, if we find that there are some more resources that are needed, then that's that's coming forward with a foundation of research, with the foundation of many people being a part of understanding what that works look like, mm -hmm. what that work looks like, and uh, and just designing from there. Okay, I okay. appreciate that very much. Yeah. thank you. Perfect timing. Thank you. Our presenter okay. here. Yep. We can move forward now to our next chapter, which is Chapter 10, Administration and Oversight. Um, I'll invite uh, Mr. Stockton and uh, Ms. Williams to the table. And I did want to ask um, Ms. Silvestri, were we taking questions after the next three or just these two? After, oh. We'll take questions after this and then okay. after the accelerators together. Okay, very good, from the last two chapters. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent. And um, what you've heard, Susan said she had the lowest budget. Rob said he has the lowest budget. I have the lowest budget. <laughs> you with me. Oh, oh. <laughs> All right, perfect. So, Rob, uh, could you bring up the slide, please? Perfect. This slide represents the funds budgeted for all offices in Chapter 10, Administration and Oversight. Chapter 10 aligns with all of the board's priorities uh, because, of the, because of the chapter includes the school system's leadership and communications. Every day, all the time, we work to align the system's work around the board, board's priorities. We all want the boats rowing in the same direction, and that direction is toward progress on the board's priorities. This chapter includes the offices of the Board of Education and Internal Audit, which the board directly oversees, uh, the superintendent of schools, uh, the Department of superintendent, the Deputy Superintendent, the school system medical officer, the chief operating officer, the chief of staff, our communications, which includes a special funds that come from the county and set aside for the instructional television special revenue fund, uh, the general counsel, and the department of partnerships. As you can see, the vast majority of the funding in chapter 10 is dedicated toward paying salaries and benefits of our people. In addition, uh, there's a funding set aside for contractual services, supplies, and materials and equipment, which include legal services and outside counsel, communication services, including the district's website management platform, web content management system, the language line, interpretation services, and other community engagement services. Also includes facility rentals, system-wide contractual services, membership in organizations such as the board associations. Next slide. This next slide shows changes within Chapter 10 from last year's budget to this year's budget. There are realignments in the budget, the Board of Education's office uh, to fund an administrative services management manager position, travel for professional development, and assistive technology equipment. And there are further realignments in the Office of Communication that reflect reduction in some contractual services, program supplies, mileage, while at the same time redirecting funds to support two-way com uh, community engagement program supplies and separate contractual services. Changes in the enterprise uh, fund reflect negotiated salary increases ratified in the FY23 budget housed in the Instructional Television Special, uh, Special Revenue Fund. Finally, rate changes reflect a nearly $400,000 reduction as a result of decreases from non-reoccurring contract and slight increases in legal and communication services. Additional details about Chapter 10 can be found in the appendix through slides 48 through 52. And next slide, we're ready for discussion. Thank you. Any questions? If there are no questions, then we can move to the accelerators because we know there's lots of content there. And uh, we'd like to finish by two, but that's our goal. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. I know you've all anticipated the discussion about the accelerators, and I know we have a variety of materials coming in your direction, but I'd like to really talk to you this afternoon about a bigger picture. 
Now, oftentimes when we talk about financial budgets, we start talking about cuts. And usually that evokes a lot of emotion when we talk about cuts. And cuts can go two ways. They can go eliminating the program or the service, or they can modify how the service is delivered. And usually folks do not want to see cuts. They don't want to see something eliminated. It's hard to take something away. So how do you change services? That's going in one direction, excuse me. That's going in one direction. I want to talk to you about going in the other direction. But I want to talk about that in relationship to what's been happening over the past four years. And I want us to look at this as a portfolio. And so I've outlined here for us, really, these decisions are investments. They're investments on what is needed today but I also want us to think big picture and begin to think about what is needed in the future. What are we going to need next year? What's going to be needed in the budget in FY24? And then how do those things play out based on the services we provide? The services are going to be provided on based on what we think the needs are, and we're going to then lay those, lay those pieces out. So if you reflect back on some of the decisions that have been made based on going back to when students really returned to school in FY22, we looked at instructional time. We looked at impact to high need schools. We looked at well-being. We looked at digital learning. And we began to lay all those pieces out. Last year, there was an effort to kind of stabilize the organization and put certain things in place so the organization, so we're building, we're creating building blocks for the next step. So the, these accelerators need to be put in that context. And what we have predominantly in these accelerators is focused. It's building off the decisions we've made in the past for focus on particular programs, but it's then also going to build next year in what specific things do we need to do in a targeted fashion. So it's a portfolio. It's much like investments that you see folks making. What, and then we also need to say what things are paying off for us, what are kids benefiting from, and then what things do we maybe need to say, we're going to stop doing this, we're going we're to discontinue. So I wanted to kind of provide, as I often say, that lens for you to look through as you're considering what the needs are, where we are today, what decisions have been made in the past, and what decisions do we need to set ourselves up for making in the future. And so with that, then I know you've got a lot of questions, and that's great. And um, I think we want to be able to kind of provide you with the, the rationale and, and the background behind that. If we could go to the next slide for just a quick second. So I know you saw this um, slide yesterday. Dr. McKnight shared this information with you. It was off the, um, uh, coming off the information that I shared with you about our data. Um, but you know we've created some buckets here along uh, and do align with the blueprint around early childhood, creating additional time, thinking about our, our graduates and getting everyone ready for um, college and career, and then how can we also expand opportunities, and that's kind of represented there at, at the bottom with the, the dual enrollment programs and uh, expanding some of our uh, IB offerings. So uh, I'll transition to this point. I think we can go then and uh, uh, bring Dr. Pugh to the table, and she can talk specifically uh, to the items that she's brought forward with her academic accelerators. Thank you. I was quick getting to the table. Um, next slide, please. Here we have a, a bucket of uh, accelerators that are directly linked to the board's strategic plan of academic excellence, uh, building on uh, what, what the work that had been done previously. During these work sessions, you've seen information about the accelerators, and today we'll talk specifically about each of them uh, related to your questions. In the area of academic ex excellence, there is an investment to support pre-K, uh, expansion. There is a continuation of tutoring and an expansion of, uh, of um, college preparation support for students who are first-time college go goers. There's also, um, in order uh, to think about 
innovation. You've seen the expansion of the innovative calendar schools to increase time for learning and the expansion of two-way immersion schools as an evidence-based strategy to support and celebrate multilingual learners. There are also programs in the budget for accelerating progress. It includes efforts to expand the IB programs and to remove the fin financial barrier that you've heard students present about here um, at the board meetings for taking many and multiple AP and IB exams. So that's a quick overview. I have specific information about each, but I'm sensing that you have many, many questions. So maybe we will go to your questions uh, after we see the other two sets of accelerators, and that leaves time for questions. Okay, so I think the next slide is Dr. Rubin or Ms. Rubin. Yes, for well being and family engagement. I called you right in. So good afternoon. Uh, so for well-being and family engagement, um, this slide is a mixture of accelerators, um, some that go beyond uh, our specific space, but certainly uh, there we have the additional coordinators and the 25 athletic trainer positions for district-wide athletic programs that we are saying will help to enhance our program overall. We know the significance of when our students uh, are involved in extracurricular activities, uh, the academic benefits that can come from that. They actually do thrive in literacy and math, and we certainly are looking at the equity across programs of all of our schools in MCPS. We then also have um, an accelerator for the 504 uh, plans, the resource and administration of that, which you heard me speak to the last time I was at the table, really looking to build out this program in MCPS to enable our counselors to have the ability to employ and engage in direct services to students by taking away some of the administrative parts of the 504, but then also looking at the professional learning that our counselors need across the system as we see an uptick in the amount of 504 plans across our district. So just a couple of the things there, and then we're happy to field any questions. Okay, so we have our first two accelerators on their ac academic excellence and well-being. And I will start on my left this time. If you have questions, please turn your light on, and please limit it to two questions. Uh, we want to make sure that we get to all board members, and then we'll go back around with additional questions, starting with Mr. Kim. Yeah, um, just one quick question. Uh, under academic uh, accelerators, the Montgomery County Virtual Academy online learning support, uh, what more specifically uh, you know, is, is that kind of role and the way that it would support? Sure. So, so there's some complexities here with the MBA. We, I mean, I think we, we spoke about this last time I was here at the board as well. So there's some unique things that the MBA is responsible for, and that requires some unique positions that are not always present in our, our traditional K-12 schools. And with this specific role, um, we have uh, roughly 125 students that are taking hybrid math 4, 5, and 5, 6. We have a select number of students who, I think we spoke about this before, The I think it's French uh, from, a, uh, from some high schools in, in the up county. We do plan to continue to offer that hybrid instruction for students that can access courses. Really, it's an equity lever, if you will, so that the courses that are uh, that you have an opportunity to take are not predetermined by your zip code or the other students who want to take them. So there is a, a need, and this has currently been filled by some of the administrative positions there um, that, were, that were in the reduction, um, to facilitate that, right? So you have to work with every single school potentially across the district to identify when that student is taking, say, math four or five in their daily schedule and to figure out a way to coordinate that through the MBA um, offering of a math four or five virtually. So we have folks that are working with potentially 210 different administrators and counseling teams to make sure that every student that needs those courses through MBA has the opportunity to do that. It's a lot of logistics, it's a lot of master scheduling, and it's a lot of you know devil in the detail work, if you will. Does that answer your question, Mr. Kim? Yeah, do you mind? No, go ahead. Uh, oh. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, um, and so is that $140,000 kind of to maintain the current um, <coughs> 
numbers? Is that just kind of uh, making sure that next year that infrastructure is still there? Or is that kind of heading towards the idea of expansion of that kind of hybrid? Yeah, it's. I think that what, what it is is it, it represents the value that we're placing on ensuring that we are being able to maintain the current level of service to our students that are taking courses through MBA but may not be full-time MBA students. And we're putting ourselves in a position for continued innovation, right? So that we, as we build and expand the program, we have folks in place who are responsible for coordinating that level of hybrid learning. And again, it's it's um, this is just a unique position that other schools don't necessarily have to to uh, to allocate for. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Reminder to board members if we can ask direct questions and if the staff can answer as directly as possible. And please refrain from using acronyms as much as possible so that our viewing audience can uh, keep up. Ms. Harris. Uh, first thing, I just have um, a couple of requests for some information um, in the questions. Um, for our um, additional innovative calendar schools and additional two-way immersion schools, can the board be briefed on the ongoing community engagement around the selection of the schools? I know you mentioned that it was going to be much more intentionally done than the last go-around, but if the board could get a sense of, of that timeline and how things are going and how, which, how we're even beginning to identify the schools to have those conversations, I, I would appreciate that. Um, and um, the college tracks expanded to five additional schools. When that's done, could we understand which five schools and how they were chosen? Um, I would appreciate seeing the demographics of the current year's virtual academy students, grade level. Um, And I think that is it for just the specific asks for a little bit of clarifying information. Um, and then my substantive questions. First goes to um, the software upgrade for our bus tracking application and the RFP. Um, I want to make sure that the RFP specifies that we're looking for um, an application, as so many other school systems around the country are using, that both allows us to centrally create more efficient and safer routes, but also provides an end user tracking. I can introduce you. Yeah. Uh, that's not one of these. This is not either oh. academic excellence or Sorry. well being. I thought we were doing them both. Okay. We are doing. What did, do you see that in yeah. here? It's under yeah. Oh, okay. Transportation? Okay. Yeah. I know. It's, it's a little odd. I'm so sorry. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. So, just to, and to make sure that it also includes that end user bus tracking app so parents, students standing at a bus stop can know in real time when their bus is coming. And then the other, the last question I have substantively looking at our proposal to include, to expand uh, to, two, to three more two way immersion schools, and one is Chinese. Having, you know, living right near a community that currently houses one of our two-way immersion schools, I know that the selection of the site, generally, it, we look at communities, and it, done in the Gaithersburg cluster and also near me, that in which the community naturally has a mix of language, um, primary languages, because these are not selection programs, these are not lottery programs, this is just, if you're in the Cashman area, this is the school you go to with an opt-out for some families. And so when I look at the proposal around a Chinese, I'm just wondering where in the county we have a community that sort of naturally has that mix of na native, of you know, primary language speaking that would lend itself to, to being chosen as a site for a two-way immersion school that's English Chinese. Sure, thank you for the question. Um, you are exactly correct, and we'll find out from the Cal report there are some recommendations about moving forward in terms of two-way immersion school identification and site location and community involvement. The distinction here is that it would not be a two-way Chinese um, program. It's one way. If you look at the ver if you think about the way it's designed, it's not designed for native Chinese speakers. So it's a, it's a unique offering. It's an additional offering. Um, Chinese is one of the most uh, in-demand uh, languages when you get to look working towards federal government, international um, 
international work, and so there is a high need for the for the use and ability of students to have it. What we do have is a variety of programs, one-way immersion programs, and we're trying to build a pathway so that we have that students can take a pathway completely elementary, middle, and high. So this would be a second um, Mandarin immersion program, correct? It does read dual enrollment. Yeah. I mean, uh, dual, dual language. language. Yeah. It's yeah. under dual language. That's why it's, we all thought it was yeah. a dual language. Two-way yeah. immersion, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. Two-way immersion. Two-way immersion. So there was, you know, discussion initially when we were putting them together. The, as you said, this community would have to have over 50% capacity of native speakers of mm -hmm. that language to be a true two-way immersion program and use the recommendations from the research. Um, so we don't have, that I'm aware of, a, a, a community that has that depth of uh, or density in its own catchment area, but we do feel like it's an important opportunity to provide students multilingual uh, opportunities. So following up, so we currently have one um, a partial immersion program at Bayard Rustin. Mm -hmm. um, so this would be, how would what is being proposed here be different from, or would it simply be another one of? It would be another one of multiple elementary schools feeding to middle school feeding to a high school program. So we don't offer the program in every single elementary school that follows that feeder pattern. So we would like to be able to expand it to other schools in that feeder pattern. So this would be not elementary, but middle and high. It so would be elementary. Oh, so I, I'm better confused. You're saying so we don't have it in middle and middle, do we? We do have middle and we have a high school program. We have a middle school immersion program. It, we, it's coursework. It's in coursework. A Chinese middle school. Where is that? Hoover. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so. And we have a high school program as well? I love this. Churchill. <laughs> My supports. I had no idea. Yes. Um, the way that they look, and maybe the reason that it seems different, is that the approach is different. It's not a full school immersion program. Right, right, Those right. courses that are offered that continue the sequence of advancing in Chinese language. So <clears throat> then would this second program, like the Bayard Rustin program, so that would, again, not be a traditional two-way immersion because would this be an application opportunity? Correct. Still it, local? It, it could be an opportunity at the local school. I think a lot of the details um, can be worked out through, you know, the coordination and planning with the communities. We've put some thinking behind where we think it would, uh, would be a good site, but we also are learning about the process of what kinds of things you need to consider. I mean, staff willingness, community interest, right. all those things are really important. So um, it, it, this proposed in the budget here today is to make the space and time for us to begin the more in-depth planning of the where. Um, we wouldn't want to engage in community conversations or school conversations prematurely when we don't have the funding to, to open a program. So really this is making space for us to have all of those conversations that you're asking about. So the plan would not necessarily be to open this in fall of 23? I think we would have, uh, we would be pushed yeah. to do that. Uh, it, it depends, again, on the community and their and their willingness and readiness and the training and the materials that we can get in. I think it's probably safer to look for a mid-year uh, advance opening. Um, but again, we can accelerate or, or go slower based upon the needs of the community and of the school. And also with our, our education partners, because um, Chinese immersion requires very specific capacity in our instructional team. Yes, mm -hmm. and human so. resources has reminded me. <laughs> sure. Okay. Since um, you yeah. brought up uh, the dual language accelerator, I have a process question. We had asked <laughs> to see evidence that this is working right. for academic achievement outcomes in our system. If as we're going to well replicate, we want to know that it right. the, the the impacts that it's having on academic achievement. So when will we see that as a part of today's presentation? As well as the extended school year. Yeah. Can I follow that up too with a, a further the tutoring? Question? Not just the tutoring. You know I'm going there, but <laughs> it, it's about the immersion program itself. Have we done an evaluation of that because? I'm not sure that the research supports that immersion is the best model. It seems as though it supports dual language. So do we have 
any um, statistics or information on the success of that? I do not have them in front of me, but I do know that there was a mid-year evaluation that was done, and it, and it showed promising practices. Dr. McKnight? Yes, um, I cannot recall. I will have to ask our curriculum folks to come up. We actually did a presentation on this sharing uh, in one of our uh, board meetings. I, the date is escaping me of the impact on students learning in MCPS as an evaluation of the dual language programs. Um, I just wanted to cite that. Uh, we can figure out exactly what date that was, but we actually there bought that for Before the pandemic, there was one. Um, it was, um, we heard from the testimony at Oak Terrace Elementary School, uh, one thing was conducted, a research and outcome was conducted before pandemic, and they were requesting that's more. That's Hazel. That's dual language, though. I'm talking right. about immersion. Correct. So let, let's just... Uh, get some order here. We had requested outcome data for the accelerators, such as dual language, uh, extended calendar, school year schools, tutoring, a number of the huge investments and accelerators that are part of our strategy to improve academic achievement for today's presentation. Are we going to get that today? So some, <laughs> some of the data is not is ongoing and being collected. You have mid-year data. Um, I heard you say about dual enrollment. Would you I'm like sorry, dual language? No, dual language. Okay. Versus the immersion. Ask, I'm going to ask um, Dr. Addison to come up. She did have the midway report. I'll let her take a minute to pull it up. What was the second one that you asked for? Tutoring. The extended day, or extended year program. Innovation. And tutoring. Oh, so all of them. So let me go through what I have. I should have done that in the first place. I apologize. So um, in terms of tutoring services, so the proposed budget offers both the continuation of online and in person before and after school. Um, there have been research meta-analysis done that show on an average of three to 15 months of learning when you're doing high quality, uh, high dosage tutoring, and it is with, our, with teachers. It's usually much more effective when it is a one on small group, and there's research to show that both academic and social and emotional um, improvements are made. For Montgomery County Public Schools, um, tutoring services to date have, have supported over 14,000 students in FY23. Of those, 75% of the students tutored by Montgomery County Public Schools staff are black or African American or Hispanic. 85% of the students using the external vendors, which are not the in-person tutors, are black, African American, or Hispanic. What we have is preliminary data from, uh, from that mid-year evaluation of the Montgomery County School provided tutoring revealed increases in the measures of academic performance, or the MAP test, uh, for kindergarten through grade eight in both mathematics and grades three through eight in reading. Um, in for Montgomery County Public Schools tutoring, 9,257 students were, were served, and through the vendor tutoring was 5,161 students served. Do we have that in our appendix? Uh, it's this. It's this one pager, uh, Doctor. We can share these after this was. Oh, this uh, the number. Let's is let Doctor Pew answer. Yes, the, the data that you have, um, we can provide the additional data that you're requesting. I should have presented it when I came forward. My apologies. You went very quickly through right. those numbers, and yes. I'm sure the, the team will, my, my colleagues will have a lot of questions. Okay. Um, so that's tutoring. Mm -hmm. So pre-K? Well, pre extended day. Uh, I mean year. I keep calendar. The innovative calendar. Sorry. You got that one? That's me. <laughs> I have that one too. Okay, there it goes. Thank you. So a couple of things that I, I'll share with you and then present to you some of the data from our last evaluation. And I'll just say that we have another planned evaluation at the end of this school year. So um, when we take a look at the innovative school calendars, Dr. David Farber, former senior researcher at the National Center on Time and Learning, identified three distinct categories that the innovative calendars can help us with. More time in academic area support classes for our students, 
greater time for teacher collaboration and more time for students to access enriched content, which we know is important because that really helps with the learning loss that they've faced. And so when we think about math and literacy and the gains that we need to make, that certainly has some implications for why we would want to extend to two more schools. So our findings are as such, fifth grade math scores were significantly higher in innovative schools for Hispanic Latino students receiving farms um, in comparison to those in schools without the innovative calendar. Fifth grade literacy scores were significantly higher as well for Hispanic Latino students receiving farms in the innovative calendar schools in comparison to those schools who did not have the innovative calendar. Some other uh, findings from our Office of Shared Accountability included some strong points of the program, adaptive leadership, leaders having the ability to adapt the, to meet the needs of the students in the program, the enriched learning, the time that the students got resulted in the scores that I just shared with you, strong uh, staff and materials. These schools adopted mindfulness, and they were able to show that students were more available for the learning, participated in that and their staff members as well. They saw that as a gain and certainly the extended learning over the year providing 30 extra days that allowed for some consistency in the learning environment for our students and then cited consistent communication, staff being clear about the expectations and the communications. Two other findings that I will share. The retention rate at our innovative calendar schools was actually really high. We were really concerned about that initially, being that the staff is there longer than some of their peers in other schools. But when we looked and worked with OHRD, the retention rate of staff at these schools was extremely strong. And then the final piece is just uh, taking a look at all of the program strengths, um, thinking that uh, the innovative schools offered staff the opportunity to be immersive and collaborative with leadership around the expectations for the innovative calendar schools and what is expected of them as staff members. And this evaluation was done two years ago? Yes, 2021, and I do believe, and Dr. Addison is in the audience, she can hold me accountable for that, but I do believe at the end of the year we're also bringing forward some additional information about the innovative school calendars. So we, we saw this presentation um, back then, uh, and it was, it said you know, we need a, another evaluation because this is in the middle of the pandemic. But can you please just repeat the academic achievement outcomes that you gave a lot of uh, outcomes, but just um, it's hard for me to listen and digest. So if you could just repeat the academic outcomes again, please. Fifth grade math scores were significantly higher for Hispanic Latino students receiving farms, which has not been the traditional um, academic outcomes that we've seen in our data um, traditionally. And fifth grade literacy scores were significantly higher for Hispanic Latino students receiving farms, both in our innovative school calendar schools in comparison to schools who do not have an innovative calendar. Thank you. It's Hispanic students is the only um, score, uh, Hispanic farms is the only data you have? Positive it, outcome. I'm the sorry? Only positive outcome. Oh, it's the only positive outcome. <clears throat> That's why I was asking. I'm like, I'd, I'd like to hear the others, but. Okay, should we move on to what's the other salary? Can I ask my questions first? Um, let's hear the. I'm sure everyone has questions on tutoring and in innovative uh, calendar. Let's I have some questions, though. I was going to say, I, we, we kind of already started the questions, didn't we? I know. Well, we, um, we started with Ms. Harris's question. That got us started. On, Mr. Kim, we started with it. On the dual language program. Um, which other accelerators do you have outcome data for? So um, we have we have data for the most of the ones that I spoke of early. And the TWI schools, I'm 
Dr. Addison is pulling up, but it was a historical uh, evaluation. I think part of this is that you, we are coming into a point where there were lots of innovations going on because of additional fun federal funding being available and allowing the district to try a lot of different initiatives to support academic uh, acceleration and enrichment. And what we're coming to is we are coming towards the end of the funding cycle where we will have to evaluate each of those things and report out on them and then make decisions moving forward what continues. I think what you see here is an investment and we believe these are the things that are going to show the most promise based upon midterm or previous evaluations and indications we see in current data. So it's, it's to have, we don't, many of them do not have a finished final formal report to share at this time. Did you do say you do have the dual language uh, outcome data here today? TWI? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the data that I shared, I shared very quickly. <coughs> Dr. Addison, do you have your midterm report up? Not. You go. And while they're, they're transitioning here, I'll just add, um, you know, this is a, an awful lot of information to try to present out in a limited time period to a you know, large group of folks. And so we had uh, some conversations about the best way to do this. And one of the things that we did was produce some one-pagers on some of the specific um, initiatives, accelerators, the, the big ticket ones. Um, but we were going to hold those, and that has some of the data pieces in there as well. We were going to hold those till the end just because it becomes um, challenging with multiple documents and referring people to different documents, but I think what we maybe can do is pull out some of the ones related to these specific um, accelerators you're talking about, the dual enrollment, uh, the extended calendar, and the tutoring, and I think Mr. Stockton is grabbing those now so we can pass those out, and that will help uh, guide the discussion. Wonderful. Thank you. So let's hear uh, dual language, and then we'll go back and um, ask our questions around tutoring, innovative school year, and dual language. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Um, we have an evaluation that was conducted in 2019 on two-way immersion. Um, and part of what Dr. Pugh shared in terms of kind of the mid-year check-in, if you, um, right now, we do not, we have not yet ended first semester, right? So part of what we're waiting for is to end this first semester to allow for us to do that mid-year check for this year in terms of what's happening with our um, two-way immersion and students who are accessing that. So to provide you with more up-to-date information in terms of the academic impact for students. Um, one of the other things that I would like to share to kind of help with this conversation, and I believe that our communications team has it, is kind of our evaluation framework to provide uh, more clarity in terms of how we're going to be ensuring that you receive the information in a timely manner around the different evaluations of programs and initiatives. So I'm not sure if comms has it um, that they could pull up, but um, I do think it would be beneficial for this conversation to kind of to help inform what we're doing and wh where we're heading as a district to better inform these conversations. So I don't. Do we have that on the slide deck, Miss? We don't. <clears throat> but Dr. Stockton went to go get it. Is that correct? Oh no. Oh no. Oh sorry. But I've heard Ms. Hazel talk about uh, the positive outcomes that we have seen in, in dual language, uh, two-way immersion. So I'm, I'm, well, I'm not clear on what we're waiting on to evaluate. We've I'll let her So I was going to say I could ask a different question. Go ahead, Ms. Hazel. Yeah, so thank you. When we presented this fall with the evidence of learning, and we looked at particularly our students who receive English language development services, um, and the schools that um, elevated to the top as having better outcomes for students who receive services, we did see that more than half of our, we have six two-way immersion schools, and we saw three or four of them that rose to the top as, as having improved outcomes for English language development, and those, those students were receiving two-way immersion um, instruction or programming. So we certainly felt that that was um, a positive indicator. Again, we have to wait for evidence of learning. Um, 
students will finish their assessments in February. That will give us a better indicator. Same thing with our um, tutoring. When they finish their assessments in February, that will give us a better indicator of how these programs are impacting or the programs are impacting student learning. Um, but we do, we, you know, the Center for Applied Linguistic, Linguistics did give us a lot of feedback about our program that we'll talk about on Thursday um, and recommendations for how we can improve our programs. But um, we do see glimmers of um, some really good practices taking place in those programs. Can I ask her a question? Just put, I just off what she said. <laughs> Me too. A lot of people want to ask questions. So I, when you say Thursday, all you mean the special population? Special pops, yes. Mm -hmm. okay. So um, we are going to start our questioning. And uh, thank you, board members, for your patience as we sort this out. Um, so if you have any questions around the uh, additional information that was given around tutoring, dual language and innovative school year, please put on your light and we will delve into this as much as you would like. Um, so we interrupted Ms. Harris, so we'll start on this side with Ms. Harris and then we'll work our way to back. Um, yeah, I would just say um, for the two, uh, uh, the innovative school year, school data, um, I think another important data piece point is the attendance data. Um, because having been to both Arcola and Nick's at the start of a school year, that was a conversation um, that some families just um, don't show up until the first day of the traditional <coughs> calendar. And so with the attendance data and then what are those outcomes looking like um, for students who are actually families who are also there and then those who don't show up until the start of the traditional school year. Um, and then um, I don't know, if, do we have that now or we... And just getting it. So we presented the attendance data for both Arcola and Nix, which hovered somewhere between the 75 percentile. I think one a little bit higher in the 80 percentile. Um, subsequent to that meeting, remember the board asked us some questions about the attendance. So we have attached Steve Neff, who is our pupil personnel service services uh, to our schools, and looking at a cohesive way that we can leverage the student well-being teams to work with families that are taking vacation during this time of year and monitor the attendance. So we have some key things that we've put in place to address the attendance. We can bring that data back when we bring back the evaluation data, but attendance is a significant data point. Yes, and um, also, so you gave us some um, outcome data uh, fit, uh, on our uh, Hispanic students' farms, uh, but if we could... I don't know what percentage of the demographic of those two schools falls into that. So if we could get the rest, I think my colleagues already asked about it. And then on the tutoring piece, I would be interested to see if we have any customer feedback data. And if that's differentiated between <coughs> those who are referred for tutoring and those who ask for tutoring. Right. So anyway, thank you. Mrs. Madrowski. Yep. Um, most of what I had down here has been touched on, but um, under the college and career readiness, I'm curious as to um, why college tracks in five more high schools as opposed to middle school college and career coordinator supports that we've heard so many people talk about and um, testify to and stuff like that. And do we have data on, on college tracks? So we do have some data on college tracks. Um, for example, 75% uh, of the participants in college tracks were first generation college students. Um, that it does support the academic excellence um, and the acceleration work that we're engaged in um, in MCPS. I, I think in reference, to, I can go back and, and bring back a response, but I do believe the college tracks is an existing program. We, we budgeted out the extension to five more high schools. I'm certainly happy to revisit it and take a look at the opportunity for middle school participation is that yeah it's it's more a matter of from my understanding um, and obviously I don't have the facts or details um, of the data in front of me but that um, the number of students that college tracks um, supports is 
what I would consider on the smaller side. Um, and what I was feel like the community has been asking for is a broader support of students to be able to even before they get to high school, figure out, you know, work with someone to figure out career pathways or, you know, whether it's areas of interest, do they know what programs are available in our different high schools, do they want to participate, do they know that if you want to participate in the CTE healthcare program, you have to have taken classes X, Y, and Z before, you know, while you're in ninth grade so that you can qualify for it, things like that. Um, and those were the things that I was hoping that a middle school coordinator um, could do. So I wanted to comment on, on uh, that one. It is very similar. Thank you very much. Coming around to you are copies of some of the one pagers outlining the accelerators and some of the data behind that. Um, as Mr. Hull said, he was going to share this with you at the end, but I think it's a good reference point for you to be able to look at now. But to your question, uh, Ms. Mondrowski, earlier, um, I can't remember exactly what we were talking about, what topic, oh, it was the directors. And, and I shared the importance of not just adding on positions, but being very clear about what it is that the positions that we currently have available in our schools and how we're utilizing them um, and evaluating the effectiveness of that mm -hmm. is the first step. And I see this as, an, as another example of that. But what I can say is that, um, and I've said this before, in an environment in which we have to create a school system that provides internal support and external support because we will never hire our way out of all of, the, all of the support that we have to provide to our students. But what we do have a responsibility of doing is evaluating the programs that have shown success and College Tracks is one. As a matter of fact, I know there was, uh, I saw it, I want to say about a month ago, um, Dr. Addison, we did a program evaluation for that program specifically, and it was the data in that program evaluation that showed us, well, students who go through college tracks are having much more success in not just going to college, but completing college through the support that, that is provided to them. And we specifically looked at students as first-generation college uh, students who are able to do that. Now, could they probably provide more services to our schools? Absolutely, so that they could provide larger number of students that services. But that is going to cost. Um, and in some, in some cases, I think that it's important for us to be able to contract out some of our programs like this one versus um, starting from trying to build an infrastructure within, when we have some infrastructures within, but we need to look at how we're utilizing them and marry them up with the programs like College Tracks to help support our students. I just a lot of the kids that testified, I don't know they're going to part be able to participate in the College Tracks, you know, like kids that came even in to our hearings, our public hearings. Yes, yeah, so it, it, it and, and that's a very good point. It is our responsibility to make sure that even as we expand, if this budget is approved and we are able to expand, that we're actually expanding into the schools in which students who can benefit this, from this program, we're expanding it in the right places and making sure that it's getting to the students that need it. I think Ms. Rubens was trying to get her light on. Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. I apologize. There were just several other data points that I wanted Please. to share. Um, nine, about 97% of the college track students who were, accept, were accepted to a four-year college in the 2021 and 2021-2022 school years, 50% of the participants were receiving farm services, and most participants have been Hispanic, Latino, and or Black, African American. And we have some more data points from the evaluation Dr. McKnight just referenced as well. I just for clarification, I have no doubt about what a good program it is. I just think, to uh, Dr. McKnight's point, I personally believe every child needs that kind of support because regardless of, you know, anything else, if you don't know what you're doing, you flounder. So um, that's why I was just hoping to see something a little bit more broad. As a follow-up, uh, that college tracks evaluation, can that be please shared with the board so we have all that data in front of us as well? And um, if I remember correctly, the blueprint does talk about what you're mentioning, middle school yes, interventions. So we will probably have to look at that um, in next year's budget. Ms. Evans. Yes, um, just one quick question for Ms. Rubin. And, um, for our um, innovative t 
teachers, do they have um, a different time that they receive professional development? They don't try to do it at the same time as our other staff in the summer, and that, that's probably like a silly question, but I just that just hit me for some reason. No, it's a great question, um, Ms. Evans. They do have a different time, and their professional learning is ongoing and throughout the year, and one of the amendments we made as a result of feedback from the staff was to work with them to determine when they receive that professional okay. learning at both of the schools, and we would extend that process to any oncoming schools as well. Okay, thank you. So my next question is for Ms. Hazel. So you you jog my memory. So um, first, to remind me, did we start our first um, two-way immersion program like in 2017? When was our first? Was it first earlier? I'd well, say it was 2018. 2018. Or 2018. Okay, 2018. Okay. So then you made the comment just now that some of our, where we saw some, some good data was where our students were receiving the English language development services. So, like, I'm trying to jog my memory, but I, you made me think of that point when you said that that I thought our initial intent for, for our two-way immersion programs was to help students that um, English was necessarily their first language. And so what we're trying to do was find areas throughout the county to place the programs, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. So then, correct. so we're still doing that, correct? Yeah, so that is the purpose of a two-way immersion program. It is really seen as an English language development right. um, service for students. Um, so we look for schools where we have almost half of our student population who speaks a, a language other than English um, to build, so that's, that is their, um, their way, our way of accelerating not only um, the language that they come, their, their native language, but also then English. The data, uh, if you look at research, it shows that you won't really see the growth in those students until they hit third and fourth grade. Okay. So they're learning two languages, K, one, two, and then by the time you start, get the students get into third and fourth grade, you start to see them leveling off with the other, um, their peers, and then in, in many cases increasing. So our, our students are just getting into those upper grades now when we started that program um, prior to the pandemic. Uh, and so we do expect to see, as they're getting in, you know, fourth and fifth grade, that we'll start to see the data really increase for those students. But when we took a look at our schools that were making progress, um, when we looked at our English language learners and the schools that were making some nice gains, um, some of those schools were our two-way immersion schools. So my other, I guess, comment, I, I heard us talk about that we have so we have three more schools that are coming on to being two way immersion and one. then um one so two being two way immersion and then one it's three total right and then one being yeah so let's I'm, I'm gonna complete my sentence and then one being one way which is the Ch chinese um language um and so then i heard us which we always say we want community involvement, and we're going to kind of put it together, talking with the community. Is there, my hope is that there's a way that we do all of our programs and that there's not a, there's not differentiation from, like, depending on, like, at each school, right? So there's a way that we implement it and we do it, and there's consistency across the board. Correct. Yes, so that is actually a very great comment. It sounds like to hear. To be, right. Yes, on Thursday, it's the special populations um, feedback from Center for Applied Linguistics. One of the comments is going to be around consistency from program to program. There is not quite the consistency that we'd like to see at this time, and so that is something that we are our team is working very hard on. Um, but as we select schools, um, we you know we certainly have learned a lot from our last implementation. Um, we want to, we have an idea of a handful of schools that meet the criteria just based on students, but certainly we want to work with our partners in MCPS, our association partners, our community members, work with our staff and figure out, you know, who where um, we have staff that um, are able to speak academic 
Spanish and uh, Chinese, and um, then begin the process of implementation and really using those recommendations from Center for Applied Linguistics. Our goal is to have all of our programs implementing with more consistency. Yeah, um, and, I, and so I, I think it's easy to forget. So we started in 2018. The pandemic happened in 2020, right? And so I know that we did get questions from um, a lot of parents at one point, and we did yep. some meetings, and you all were gracious and coming and talking. Um, not being able to, I think I just heard um, uh, the Miss, um, and you're look, I'm looking right at you. I don't know why I can't even think of your name. You know I know <laughs> you. Addison, yes, yeah, Dr. Addison, I'm sorry, um, that you said we just ended, or that, no, Dr. Pugh might have said we just ended first semester, like, so it's hard to be able to evaluate, and so I, I hope I was like, I'm dumping on you all, but I do know that because, you know, the pandemic happened, right? Um, not an excuse, but definitely we were trying to do what was most important at the time, right? That um, there that there will be some consistency going forward. There will be a way that we do it, and we will be able to evaluate the programs, and then just really be intentional about where we're placing the program. So I just yes. no, but you all said some things that jogged my mind, and um, just really thinking about what the intent was when we first started. And so this is probably one time that I'm I'm sad I'm not on special population. Right, so I am going to be Just tuning in. Time? Right, no, not the one, but I'm saying I'm going to be tuning in, and I, I, I love that. Um Ms. Uh, Harris is always inserting when she's going to have the fiscal management committee, because what we do want to do, because I don't know if it's the sexiest, right, because I'm going to say that mine is, <laughs> but what we do want our community to do is we want you to look at our committee meetings, because that's where all the work should be happening, really. It shouldn't be at the board table at a business meeting. It should be in our committee meetings, and we should be bringing forward that important information to the body to make our um, determinations as to how we're going to move the work for going forward. So I'm just trying to give everybody's committee a plug. Okay. Tune in to all of our meetings. On tomorrow. Right. <laughs> um, special Up Pops. Yes, yeah, Special Pops is on Thursday, and Policy is on Thursday, Thursday. as well. So Ms. Madrowski will be doing double duty. But no, I just wanted to um, say thank you to everybody that's presented so far. And I know you come up here and you try to be brief, and then we come at you real hardcore. <laughs> so we don't mean to do that. Um, I do know everybody wants to be able to ask us questions, but we do want to give our um, presenters grace in trying to share everything. And then whatever you don't hear, we can always ask questions at a later time. But just thank you all for the work, for the presentations. And um, I'll pass it over to my colleagues for the next questions. Ms. Wolf. Well, thank you for what you've shared so far, but my question is a little bit more basic in terms of the accelerators, and that is I, I'm not quite seeing what's going to improve math and reading in elementary school. I mean, early childhood, no question. Even the innovative calendar schools, if I'm willing to accept what you said, no question. But the rest of the things are basically for the academic excellence of the system, but what is going to improve reading and math, in particular for black students? Because even the data that Dr. Murphy shared yesterday supported that our Latino students are improving, but our black students are lagging behind. So I want to know what is our investment, and tutoring isn't really working for me because I'm looking at the data you've shared, and it's not seeming to support that black students are benefiting from this. So I want to know, and maybe you could do me a flow chart. You may not be able to explain it all today, but I need to see, and I know it'll start from last year with structured reading. I need to see how this is building to help black students, because if it is building, it's not helping them from what I'm seeing here. And we can certainly provide that, but I, I do want to say with the tutoring, we also implement tutoring and interventions during the school day. That is not captured in the data that you have there. That is simply before and after school. Um, but we have many students who receive um, additional instruction from teachers, from paraeducators around um, research-based, evidence-based interventions that teachers have been trained on 
during the school day where they're pulled into small groups or pulled individually. Um, and that is a part of their academic program that they have going on during the day. And so that doesn't tell the full picture of what is happening with tutoring and intervention. Um, and I do also just want to, to continue to say, as we are implementing these new programs, the, the regular ongoing professional development that we are providing our teachers through at the district level, going into support schools, and also providing that just-in-time PD, that is where we know we're going to get more bang for the buck and, and where we're really going to see improvement when our teachers are able to address those grade level standards and, and um, meet the students where they are. That, we believe, is really going to make a huge difference. So we've invested a lot with our materials. It's the ongoing training that is, is really critical and the interventions that are taking place either before and after school or during the school day that we believe is also going to make a difference. And I, and I appreciate that, thank you. But I'm still not seeing that translate into these numbers because I am seeing that our Latino students are improving from these things, but clearly there is some disconnect or something is not working as well for our black students, and I want to know how these accelerators, other than early childhood and innovative calendar schools, are going to improve reading and math. So may I borrow this? Sure. <laughs> and I've scribbled all over. That's okay. I just want to. I, I don't have that, so I wanted to to take a look at it. So let me walk through this uh, with you to be able to make a connection. I think the first one that you mentioned was Innovative Calendar Schools. So when the Innovative Calendar Schools presentation came to the board, I, I again, forgive me for the time frame. What we do know is who's in those schools. In our Innovative Calendar Schools that we presently have right now at Arcola and Nix, those students are, uh, are predominantly black and brown students. Let me just interrupt you there. I'm willing to accept pre-K and Innovative mm -hmm. Schools. It's the other ones that I okay. don't understand. I'll move, thank you, I'll move to the next one, college mm -hmm. and career readiness. Mm -hmm. So if I were to ask the staff to pull up right now, prior to COVID, during COVID, who were the students who were enrolled in our IB AP programs? What I can guarantee you is that the majority of them were not black or brown students. So when we look at this accelerator, this accelerator is going to improve the academic experience of black and brown students because we've already removed one of the barriers that we heard from themselves that they've said, which is their hesitancy to enroll into those classes because of the exorbitant amount of fees that are associated with it. Um, I also connect this to not just at, uh, academics and, and, and rigor for literacy and mathematics, but it goes way beyond that. Um, and it also connects directly with us becoming an anti-racist school system. Um, um, and not to just focus on student learning, but who's learning and how are they learning and what are we going to do about it. So that's that's one connection I wanted to make to college and career readiness. Um, the team spoke about the dual language. The next one I see is the expanding of the IB programs. So. Someone brought this up earlier, um, but I'll go back to we have had IB programs in Montgomery County Public Schools for years, and we've had a few programs that have been known as the signature programs that everyone tries to get into. And then after that, when they don't get into those programs, parents ask, well, what is going to be the ex learning experience of my child if I did not get into this program? The system, I believe it was in 2019, I just remember Scott Murphy was the person sitting there presenting, um, came and presented the plan to expand. And we had much conversation mm -hmm. around how we were going to make sure that there was fidelity in implementation of those programs so that we would also have a good satisfaction rate of those programs. So we expanded IB at the high school level. What we also know is if that type of rigorous instruction is not um, encouraged or supported or exposed to children prior to them getting to high school, then they are going to be reluctant, 
question and all those things to not move into those programs in which we've intentionally expanded. So under expanding IB programs, you see our middle years program there because we did not do anything to serve as a conduit to the IB expansion. And that means exposing our learners earlier to the academic rigorous programs that we want them to be engaged in. And most importantly, yesterday I showed you middle school data. I didn't even have that data prior to releasing this budget. But I think it is a perfect example of looking at what the middle school um, academic picture was that I shared yesterday that even speaks to more of why this middle years program is going to be critically important for middle school students so that they can, one, get that exposure and, and, and get that support um, that they need in middle school that then extends to the IB program. Um, are there any others you want me to speak to? Does that answer to? your but question, Ms. No, Moore? because I want to know what's going to raise the scores of black children in reading and math in elementary school. In eighth grade, you're showing pretty good numbers for Latino students. Nothing great for black students. What is going to get them to that point in the middle school that they're even eligible for this? Absolutely. Programs? So I'm, I'm going to say for uh, middle school, all of our children are going to need to fuck, they're going to need to, to buckle down and, and, and we're going to need to work with them because I quite frankly wasn't happy with where any of our students were in the middle school data from yesterday. Mm -hmm. But going back to elementary school, I'm going to go back to what Dr. Murphy shared at the very beginning of the presentation. In the two and a half year plan, two years ago I believe it was, we said that there were certain things that we were going to do in that first area of mitigating learning disruption because we acknowledged and knew that we were going to need to invest in the next three years of COVID-19 to address that. So I'm going to go back to last year because that was really our first year <coughs> where it wasn't a normal year, but students were back in school um, full time. Last year, we invested in, at the elementary level, a reading specialist in every single elementary school. That was one of the biggest investments we could have made to sustain and support the development of early learners because we know that we needed our teachers to be able to quickly assess and get the support that they needed to be able to support students with literacy. So that was the first, I would say, building block that we invested in, um, as well as the staff development teacher and the science of reading. We did all of, we shared all the research, all the support around why that was actually going to be the specific program that raised the lever for black and brown students, specifically in our system in the area of literacy. So all of that was last year. Now, let's get to this year, and I'm not covering everything from last year, but this year is building block two. Because when we look at these investments and the impact on children, we actually can't look at it in one year. We have to look at how we're building that. So last year, thinking specifically about elementary literacy, we invested in the reading specialist, I'll call out, in the science of reading. So now we're saying we're going to expand in pre-K expansion because we want to back the car up and prepare them now before they get to kindergarten so we're not having to worry about closing these specific gaps. Um, and in that, we brought in the research and said, where are we seeing the children rise above? And I'm going to go back to what uh, Nikki Hazel mentioned earlier in her presentation. When we looked at where elementary students were faring, we did see glimmers in our dual um, language programs. And so we look at what's happening there. We take into consideration this is a diverse community. All of our children are going to benefit from also knowing two languages as, as well as aiding their learning in, in the areas of literacy and mathematics. So that would be another indicator. Um, and then in addition to, you said you understood the uh, innovative calendar schools. They're in elementary schools specifically for, for black and brown um, that are in more black and brown communities. Um, and the research says more time is what those students need. So you add that on to the tutoring, the more time, to the tutoring, to the reading specialist, to the science of reading. I mean, we have made some significant investments in our students as it relates to literacy because the data that we saw, yes. I mean, we are faring better than many others, but we've got ground to make up and we've got to continue to put the support in the right place and uh, accelerate which is exactly what these, these accelerators are um, outlined to do. I, I, I hear you, 
And it's not that I'm opposed to the accelerators. I do think they support academic excellence in our system, but it does not support reading and math in elementary school for our black students. And I understand, I think I said when we started that we started our investment last year, but our investment, and maybe, you know, it's just gonna take longer, does not seem to be uh, showing up in our black students the way it is in our Latino students. And I'm just trying to figure out why and what we need to do differently. There are a few statistics that I just wanna mention that I think are gonna be really important as we look at the data. Our Latino students are our fastest growing population in Montgomery County Public Schools. And so when they represent a larger aggregate of stu students that we're looking at, I mean, we're going to see that they're gonna fare differently in the data. So we're comparing the two, I think that's the first thing that we, we need to and should acknowledge. Um, the second thing is, this is truly our first normal year. Although we've invested in those accelerators, we also have to know that and we said this when we first started with COVID-19, which is why we said these are gonna be areas that we focus on consistently for three years. We're really gonna see the payoff in the investments, as any research says, three to five years. So that's the difficult part for us. We don't see um, the impact of the specific accelerators happening quickly, but uh, yesterday I'm gonna go back to, and, and, and looking at specific student groups, but I'm gonna go back to we are faring better than many, and our job is to be able to bring forward the things that we have found to be successful in our student groups um, as it relates to these accelerators. And one of the things that may help is, as I listen to the questions in the conversation, as we roll out these accelerators, we can actually, because I know we have this for college track specifically, we have student uh, ethnicity data that can speak to how some of these programs are impacting student ethnicity groups specifically. But of course, some of our investments are not going to be able to line up to a specific group like a staff development teacher or a reading specialist. But we know those, over years of practice and research, we know that those are the things that work and we've identified as big lever points in, uh, in our students and their, their learning. Thank you, I don't guess there's very much else you could say, but it's just not satisfactory to me that, that um, our students seem to be left behind in one particular group. I don't know what we need to do to improve it, but year after year, and it's only seeming to me to go down, not be, I don't even see a trajectory going up. So I just need to know what our investments are so that if anybody asks me, I can explain to them that it started last year, this is what we invested, this is what we're seeing, this is what we're trying to do this year, this is what we hope the outcome will be. And I will look in whenever you come back with the evidence of learning data to see what that's looking like. Thank you. Can I ask a follow on? question to that point is just, um, you know, one of the questions I had was when I look at the budget, you know, what is the core content of professional development that your office has prioritized related to literacy and math and for who? Um, I know you invest, we're investing in a new curriculum and I'm curious um, how we are supporting teachers with fidelity in order to ensure that they are able to effectively implement and have access to the new curriculum and make sure that we're addressing the needs of each child in that the way Mrs. Wolf is talking about. Yeah, so we um, definitely, we, we are in full implementation now. We started this summer, um, and even with the mathematics, even though it's not new, we continued this summer providing professional development. Um, we are continuing throughout the school year with implementation support with between our office and SSWB um, and special education. We're all working together to, to um, support the implementation and continue ongoing professional development um, with leaders and with our teachers. And so that continues. And as we look to um, purchase new curriculum, which also is a part of the, the budget as well, um, that is something that we will provide professional development on. We have to actually speed up the process so that we can meet the needs of our innovative calendar schools and make sure that they are prepared to go um, when they need to be. So the professional development is ongoing. 
and um, throughout the school year and for, for literacy, particularly with our, our science of reading, for mathematics, um, really focusing on those particular major standards that um, we expected our students during the pandemic and then even coming out of the pandemic where we saw there were some major standards where large groups of our students were not um, doing well with providing that professional development. As we um, are anticipating the state data, we um, want to take a very close look at mathematics. We knew that when we looked at our evidence of learning data, particularly middle school math was of concern. We, um, we want to see if that trend continues with our state data. And then we want to, we have some some uh, initial thinking around it, and um, there's areas that we want to really dig into um, around our acceleration practices, around um, you know just how we are providing grade level instruction. So the middle school math and and how we are preparing students at the elementary to get to middle school are some huge areas that we're in conversation with now uh, around what we might need to do in the curriculum office to make changes and what we may need to. Do do to support our teachers. I appreciate that. Just to Ms. Wolf's point, I just feel like it's going to need to be very targeted if we really want to actually see in, you know, real increases and in change. I just want to follow up on what Ms. Mandrowski said about professional development. When you come back with the, the data, I'd also like to see, and somebody sent this to me for, for the earlier version, but a breakdown by school mm. of, of um, the literacy scores and the math scores. And, and I'm going to tell you what I'm looking for. I'm looking to see if what you're hearing in the anti-racist audit, if you can somehow connect it to a school and see where we might need to do more work in professional development in a school. Because it's just my belief, and I know this is a controversial thing to say, that there are people that don't believe that black students can succeed and that is carrying through to their instruction. Now, so write to me if you want to. <laughs> I don't care. You know. Thank you. Ms. Yang. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. In this budget, I'm looking for our ongoing investment on our students' mental health and well-being. And um, I would like to see that as a system, when we addressed mental health needs, we addressed the mental health and well-being of students of all grade levels. And we always say we want to not to be a system that's reactive when issues arrive, but proactive so that um, we will ensure the uh, successful outcome of our students. So preventative measures from our youngest learners. Um, from this budget, where can we see the investment on mental health? Now, I would like to specifically point to the elementary school levels. Uh, research have shown that uh, a lot of mental health issues arises when students reach 14 or 15, the most common onset. But it can happen now as early as 10 to 12 years old, right? And we also know that um, the investment we have made, the huge investment we have made last year uh, on our social workers, they stationed in our high schools and our elementary schools are not covered by those social workers. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, they do not have a one-to-one. -one. They don't have one-to-one. -one. Thank you for that. And uh, we understand, we have seen the data that our special education caseloads increase 504 caseloads are happening across our systems. So our, our counselors are participating in more of the meetings, in the more of the process of IEPs and 504s. So I want to see here where are we helping our elementary school student in their uh, mental health and social uh, emotional well-being. Where is our investment and, uh, uh, in that area? And we 
have also heard that the point is um, there is a recommended <coughs> counselor to student ratio. <coughs> and we are far from that, especially in our elementary school levels. I know that we will not get there in one year, but what effort are we making towards that direction so that we will slowly or systematically move towards that end goal? So your question is, My um, question what are we doing for mental health for elementary school students? Mm -hmm. And how do we how are we the uh, recommended threshold for counseling for elementary schools? And I, we're talking about accelerators here, but I don't know if Ms. Ms. Rubin knows all about this topic, so maybe she is ready, prepared to answer that, or if not, that can be a follow-up. I'll turn off my mic so you can turn. No, thank you, and I'm happy to follow up. I think when we think about what is currently in place for elementary in particular, um, we find many of our resources at the community schools, which, are, as you know, are mainly or mostly elementary at this point in time. While the elementaries do not have a one-to-one -one with the social worker, that significant investment in last year's budget did allow us to have social workers who have a cluster of elementary schools that they are supporting. Um, unfor unfortunately, with our school um, psychologists, the, you know, we have some openings there, but certainly we looked at ensuring that psychologists at the elementary level trying to lower the numbers of um, school supports that they have in place. Um, Having those openings are, is impeding that a little bit, but that's another uh, form of support. And the reading specialist was a significant investment um, at the elementary level because when we think about mental health and support, having um, an individual who is there to support teachers with the academic piece, allowing teachers to have that opportunity to really build their classroom models where that social emotional learning is in embedded in the day-to-day -day lesson, um, and the elementaries do that well of all of our levels, right, where they have that built-in time every morning that they're hammering away at that social-emotional learning. So those are the investments that are currently there. I think one of the things that we're talking about at, at our bargaining is, is looking at the models for elementary, because we are hearing that... Um, Things have changed when we think about when some of those social emotional issues may have arisen. We started seeing them maybe in middle and then high school, and now we are seeing some things earlier. So we are engaged in those discussions with our elementary principals through the PLC and other venues to really take a look at that and to, to a great extent what the board has said, what is the data that we're bringing forward to justify some of the investments that we're making. So. We have 26 community schools out of our 135, or soon 136 elementary schools. Um, mental health does not discriminate according to our backgrounds or zip codes. Um, that's for one. And number two is um, that we still need to address that the dedicated staff our counselors were the ones that conducted lunch bunch, okay, social emotional lessons uh, with our students. So what are we doing in our investments in that area? Um, during last year's budget, we added the most counselors to the elementary level. We were really proud of that work because it did get us a little bit closer to the ASCA model. Um, and then we saw an increase in enrollment at many of our elementary schools that took us a little bit further away from the ASCA model. So when we think about some of the work that we're currently engaged in at the counseling level is to take a look at, with all of the resources, the coherence around resources, making sure that we're aligned both in MCPS and with our con contractual partners, right? How do we alleviate to make sure that all of the resources are providing the needed um, 
the needed help to, to our elementaries in particular. I think in addition, working to ensure that our counselors do have the ability to provide those direct services versus the administrative task. That's work that the counseling team is currently looking at. How can we take on some of the responsibilities at the central services level that takes some of that away so that they're available? We are also looking closely at the school psychologist. We just started working on this. Some data, how much time do you spend and um, conducting interviews. How many? How much time? How much time are you spending testing versus being able to provide direct services? So all of that data is going to yield for us the opportunity to say this is how we're going to be able to drive the supports in. This is what we can remove, and this is what we need to add. So it's ongoing work. I'm happy to to bring some of that forward. I just recently shared some. Dr. Murphy and I had a chance to talk about it, and I'm happy to share. It as well. So I have one more question. Any more questions? Yes, I do. I have my light on. I've had it on. Okay. Yeah. Um, so this question isn't for Ms. Rubin. I think it's more so like just a broader conversation that Dr. McKnight um, can speak to. How do we better partner with our community partners because some of these services that we're trying to offer, we're just not going to be able to take it full scale, right? And so what we don't want to do is give our community a false sense of hope for all these things, particularly around mental health, that not everybody in our school system is equipped to do that I thought that um, the press conference that we had the other day around fentanyl was a perfect example of you reacting um, with a sense of urgency, bringing together community partners that could help us in that area, right? Because you're saying to everyone, this is some issues that we're dealing with, but this is not all of our problem. And some of the questions that came up were questions that you couldn't answer. You handed it over to our um, state's attorney or to our chief of police. So how do we have a broader conversation around mental health? Because there's possibly things that we're trying to do that we can't take full scale because we're going to need more money and more people. Ms. Rubin just talked about how in our previous budget, in every single budget, we try to add more counselors. But maybe there's one less thing that we do that we're not really fully mm -hmm. equipped to do that Department of HHS can help us mm -hmm. do that we can have more school counselors to get to that, um, the, uh, why can't I think of the word, to get to our ratio that we should have, right? And so I just, and I don't want anybody to think that I'm not trying to do anything to help support our students and our families, because absolutely I want us to do that, right? But I also really want to ensure that that everybody is able to focus on teaching and learning, but what we can do is provide meals. We can, we want to provide safe environments for our mm -hmm. students, but in those areas where we're trickling to, where it gets a little bit difficult for us, but we're trying to do it because we want to make certain that our kids come to school and they're well and they're ready to learn and we can help support them. How do we talk? Like maybe we just need to have this community summit, right? Um, this countywide summit. How do we talk to our community partners and say we really need your help? Because this is what we're doing. It's a heavy lift. We can't do all of this, right? Um, so I just I wasn't posing that question to you. I wanted just to not for you to have like an exact answer, but just to say I think it's really hard. Uh, it's really hard to sit here and say we want to do one less thing, right? Because we don't, but we want to do what we can do, right? They're educators. It's, it's similar to when we had our administrators doing contract tracing, right? That's, right. that's not their job, right? But they were doing it. But it, it was a heavy lift. But at some point, we had to say, we need help. Right. Right? So I'm just that throwing that out there because our budget is $3.15 billion, and we need this money. We need all of it. Is anybody listen to me? We need all of it. But I want people to know that there's ways that we could do this where um, it's not um, people think that we're misusing funds because we're not, right? We're good stewards. We're trying to be accountable and do this work, but we need some relief somewhere. Oh, thank you, Ms. Evans, um, for that statement. You know, as I refer to where we are now in reconstruction, I've continued to say it, this cannot be work that the school system does alone, and nor will we hire our way 
out of all of the, the supports that we have to design. It's just, we, we already see that we are struggling. If you, you all remember, I think it was a, a, a year ago um, when we were so excited about the fact that we were gonna be able to bring on 50 social workers, I think it was, Mr. Room, we started out with 50, and it took us how long to get to hiring half of them and we were actually working with the Department of Health and Human Services. I mean, it's, it's, uh, we have to recognize that the labor market has shifted in so many different ways. And so when we think about the services that we're gonna be able to provide to our students and we will provide to them and to our staff, it simply cannot all be done through the school system. And we have to be able to reset um, our, our, our staff and really focusing on the things that we need them to focus on. Because for the last couple of years, they have been trying to do everything for everybody. Um, and a part of that, you know, as we were talking earlier about the directors and there was another position we were, we've got to reset um, after, after that time. So we're gonna continue to work with our partners. I mean, I know we have uh, built lots of systems and Dr. Kapunin was able to join us and have been a great, um, uh, addition in terms of making sure all of the things that we're doing around mental health and wellness, we're doing it in collaboration with the Department of Health and Human Services. I mean, even to the point which, you know, our funding in some ways are shared when you think about the wellness centers and all of those pieces because our work just overlaps in so many different ways. So it's we, what we will continue to focus on, and I think in our last board meeting I mentioned that what we can continue to do moving forward is when we're presenting this information um, with partnerships, bringing those partners to the table consistently. So that way you're able to see who they are and we can speak together about the benefits of the services that they bring to our schools and to our students. Um, I, I know they would love the opportunity and I mean it is a shared responsibility. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Rivetta Oven. <coughs> okay. I got a lot of anxiety. <laughs> Just letting you know, this has been uh, just because the, the work is enormous and I just feel like we have a lot of catching up to do, which is the basics, right? So for me, um, I kind of want to, I want to echo um, what uh, Board Member Wolf was talking about, uh, about just the basics. Show me in the budget where math instruction and reading is going to make a difference long term in that investment. And going to her point, even with the Latino population, even though we have made some gains, we're still not at a national standards, right? We're still lagging behind. And then when you look at the graduation rate data, right, we have the highest drop off, the lowest graduation rate. So we're, we're, we're like somewhere there, we're not connecting. Right, because if we kept building, then we should, our results for graduation should be higher, not lower. So for me, um, as someone from, from the outside, I, I just need to know. I need to know numbers. I, you need to tell me this is going to affect so many students. We're going to, you know, these are going to be the men, benchmarks. By then, we're going to be hitting this, you know, classroom investment in elementary school for me is basic. Because if we cannot build on the basics, we're always going to be catching up. So I guess for me, this is a little bit of the frustration in a sense. And then when I'm looking at the tutoring services, I heard you say something that was, you know, that you do the in-house tutoring, which does not reflect in the data of today. For me, in-house tutoring is a much more direct approach and hands-on because Telling me, you know, we're, we have 14,000 kids, that 85% are black and brown. I don't know what the breakdown that is, right? So if you can give me the breakdown of the 85%, and I'm gonna ask again for the data of um, where the geography of that is. Because I do wanna know, are these Title I schools, are these, you know, because if this is an equity tool, then I wanna know if it is an equity tool. Um, and I want to know that you know our families have access to it. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you is, you had and there was a small thing on there, but I'm very curious because this is a population that there's growth and it's a literacy at birth and literacy for young mothers program. So I want to you know, and you have 100 and K allocated to that program. 
Um, and I'm just curious to know what is the, the, the instruction? Is this something that we already have? If there's something that we're building on, because this is something that is really important to even our graduation rates for for some of these um, for some of these students. So um, I just want to know how much you know, 100K. How many kids are we going to be impacted with uh, that kind of investment? Um, and I think that's. I, I had a question about the innovative uh, calendar, but I think um, some of my other colleagues uh, were very thorough on it. I still have some questions on community schools, and I know that will be coming up. Um, but if you could answer at least those, I would appreciate it. Sure. Uh, starting backwards first. So the the uh, early literacy initiative is actually a really exciting proposal because one of the things that we know from research is that when families do not have access to, to reading materials in the home, that disadvantages the students and they are less literate and numerate when they come to school. So uh, what this money specifically, I think the question was, is for is for books. Books for families from birth, from the, the time that they enter Montgomery County School schools, through our hospitals, and through partnerships, we can expand. So it, this is to start uh, an initiative that I know makes a difference for students. It also makes a difference for families. I think if you look at the research, um, there was a lot of a big research that was done not, not that long ago, but basically it said that it, it was proven to positively benefit students in both reading and mathematics simply by having access to books in the home. 80 books is what they were saying was sort of that threshold, um, that by the time they were teenagers that they needed to have access to at least 80 books in the home and that correlated to their continuing education data. Um, it also engages families. It engages families with the school early on and it gives them a connection to Montgomery County Public Schools from the minute that the students are born. We can deliver early uh, developmental um, developmentally appropriate milestones for families. So that's sort of an exciting new initiative to get it started. Or can I just do, is this, at, is this at every high school? Um, or could you just maybe just give us a little more information on that? Sure, so it's books for babies born in the hospital. All, starting with you know as many as we can cover with what we have budgeted hopefully we can get other partners to join us join with us there are a lot of uh, organizations who also have early literacy as their mission thank you for clarification because i had a, a a totally different idea okay. of what this program was for i really thought it was to support young mothers who had babies with literacy and so they don't get behind in their school work and they actually you know are able we are able to support them so they're actually able to graduate on time. So for me, it was, thank you for clarifying that. That is a component of it, too. Oh, it is a component. Yes. Okay, yes, which it is, is not okay. just giving them the resource, but right. also supporting them um, and getting them acclimated to the services provided in the system uh, prior to them going into pre-K, providing them with those resources. And again, working with the parents of how you expose your child to language early, how you expose them to good communication and all those pieces prior to, so it's really backing up from pre-K. And how many students are we serving um, currently? This is an accelerator, so it's brand new. Oh, I'm sorry, so, so, not. What's, so what's our, our benchmark? How many do we hope to serve? Well, we're going to actually look at what our birth rates tell us uh, this year. We actually looked at a little bit of that in our CIP. Um, our birth rates are declining, quite frankly, in uh, Montgomery County. Um, so Not among Latinos, but I think everybody else. <laughs> yeah, so we're, um, so we're prepared to actually expose all families to this. We started out, we actually started out, and sometimes our accelerators take a, um, a different turn, but we started out saying a physical book, and in some cases we said, if we don't have enough funding for the physical books, we will do an audio book and send it out virtually to families so that we have the different resources and actually giving our families in some ways a, a, a choice to, to choose, so. But it'll depend on how many births we have. And, and the last thing I just want to piggyback <clears throat> on my colleague, um, Ms. Sh um, uh, Shepherd Evans' comments, that I too feel kind of that we are trying to do more um, with with because we've been doing it. You know, we've been doing it during the pandemic. We have been pretty much a jack of all trades to be able to do um, and to answer you know the needs of our students. 
Um, but I really, really think with your accelerators that we need to kind of look at really the academics and ensuring that our teachers have what they need in order for us to be able to achieve all those benchmarks early on so we can keep on building. And, and we do have partners and we do have folks who, uh, when it comes to mental health or when it comes to, um, uh, you know, all the other stuff that is, that, that those are their expertise. And certainly, there needs to be, you know, a synergy that we, we do that. But I just, I just want to make sure that we are not overextending our staff in doing more with less and trying to be everything to everyone. Because there's just so much we can do. And I think, for me, the focus is, you know, making sure that our kids, when they finish fifth grade, like they are reading at a level that it is, you know, and, and they're writing at a level that is appropriate for their age so they can go on to middle school and have a strong foundation and we keep build, building on that because it just seems like, you know, there's just so much. I'm telling you, I'm just getting anxiety just thinking about it. Just This is like an enormous thing, but I just want to say thank you to the staff, you know, for, for putting this together. But um, again, I, I feel um, Mrs. Wolf's, you know, frustration, um, and I, I really think that that's um, that should be our main focus. Thank you, Ms. Rivetta Oven. Uh, Ms. Harris. Yep. Um, I first want to just thank my colleagues for the emphasis mm -hmm. on our expectation that we are not going to be asked to spend money on programs and extending programs if we don't have the data to support their value. Um, and for some things, when you begin them, you're looking at an external evidence base, but once we're implementing them in our system, we need to see how they're working here. Um, so I, I just wanted to say that. And I did have a couple of specific questions. And um, one, um, and I apologize, every time I see the number 25, I immediately think high school because that's how many high schools, comprehensive high schools we have. So looking at the accelerator on athletic trainers, I thought we had done that already. Is this 25 more? Because we, we did budget and we did do an, an appropriation earlier in the year to, cu to close the gap for the high schools that did not at that point have trainers. So is this like 25 more in addition to the 25 we already have or what's this? Good afternoon. Um, this is not 25 more. Right now, we contract out the athletic trainers. Uh, we employ four different vendors, and we had difficulty, if you recall, from the back in August, filling those final last couple schools. Um, and so that contractual model we found has not been successful, especially coming out of COVID. So what we are proposing is bringing the athletic trainers in as MCPS employees. Okay. And there is a coordinator of health and safety that would both supervise that, uh, the athletic trainers, but also build out and enhance our sports medicine program. So, you know, one of the tracks in our Academy of Health Professions leads to that physical trainer certification, so grow your own. Just, just a little reminder. Um, and then, Ms. Rubin, could you speak, one of the conversations we've been having for quite a while is how do we reduce the workload on our professionals, our credentialed mental wellness professionals um, that doesn't require their professional expertise and licensure. So that administrative work that doesn't require their expertise to perform, and we've been talking about that. So I'm looking with great interest at the accelerator, the, the resources for admin of 504 plans. What's the vision for that? How will it be implemented? And since we know that equality is not equity, how are we going to make sure that that resource gets to the, the places that are really, where that, that staff is really, really overburdened with that admin piece? Yes. I love that question. I, I'll, I'll let Mr. Monteleone mm -hmm. field it. Thank you. Um, so this, so let me just say that at, at, 
when I took this seat on July 1, this was one of the big rocks, right? Um, and along with Dr. Cruz, we have been meeting throughout the year uh, with a group of counselors who have advocated, right, um, for a reduction of some of the administrative positions. We've been collaborating with them, listening to what their needs are, um, and exploring possible opportunities. So what you see in the budget is part of this accelerator um, is this coordinator uh, for district-wide 504s. This is a position that where we, um, you know, we partner with special education on this uh, at all times because of the compliance issue. Um, and then those two specialists, and then the siphon. So let me, if I'll just address the question about the, the I mean, the coordinator and the specialist. Um, you know, these are in place so that we can provide both a district-wide uh, method of decreasing the variability of the best operational procedures to, to administer 504s and facilitate and coordinate 504s. It, we have found through, um, like we have data that we've been doing, voice data, I've been visiting school counseling teams, um, and Dr. Cruz throughout the entire fall has been meeting with the resource counselors. This is a standing agenda item. We're surfacing up best practices that schools are currently employing and that we are trying to, to scale those across through our resource counselors. So we've been doing a lot of work. But with the, the coordinators and the specialists, they would be plugging directly into schools as needed that have disproportionate numbers of 504. So you talked about the equity piece there. Um, we would be learning, right, from how some schools are administering these in a very effective way and then building out the PD specifically on 504 administration through that office. Um, we do have a specialist this year that we have employed solely to address 504s. We had five elementary schools that were single counselor elementary schools where the, the counselors were either on long-term leave or maternity leave or what have you. And um, our specialist has been in the building helping to carry the load to support in those areas. With respect to the stipend, um, we know right now that some schools do have a disproportionate number of 504s. We did the math, so we looked at this and we looked across the board. And by the way, the data on 504s, it was referenced, it has increased. In 2000, school year ending in 2017, 4,532 504s. This year, 22-23, it has nearly doubled 8,523 in five years. Um, and so this, these, this does, these numbers fall differently across different schools. So with the stipend, we're looking at, we looked at the average number of 504s by level, elementary, middle, high, across the district. We then looked at outliers, schools that are vastly, you know, uh, have a disproportionate number of 504s. We then broke it down by counselor, right? What is the average caseload for each counselor of 504s? If the average middle school counselor, for example, has 10, this school has three, this school, the average middle school counselor has 22, for example. So the idea behind that stipend, frankly, is to compensate individuals who are going above and beyond and, and carrying that load. I mean, it would be for administrative purposes, right? So those stipends would go to schools with that disproportionate number of 504s to be able to compensate folks for the administrative tasks involved. Maybe a, um, a support personnel, it may be a, a counselor uh, involved there, and we generally have some autonomy, right, at the school level for how those stipends are employed. Um, but we are, uh, at this point, really, really looking at how we can more effectively operationalize 504s at the school level, right? Increasing our direct support from central service and compensating um, uh, the staff that are carrying a, hev a heavier load. So that is what you see represented in this accelerator. Um, and we continue to work collaboratively with the, the counseling adv uh, advocacy group. Um, because long term, um, you know, again, can't staff our way out of it talk about contractual services, whatever it may be, but this continues to be a big piece of this. We have data. We Last year, we looked at um, the amount of time that counselors are spending doing each of their tasks. We have broken that down. Every single one of our secondary school counselors, right, counseling offices, for example, when a student comes in, they enter and log in through their the, a Chromebook, and we can track and see why students are, are coming to our counselors. So we're looking at service data. We're looking at time on job data as well as we make these decisions. Okay, thank you. So, but I just want to be very clear. The $931,000, that's not all stipends. You're creating some I, I specific positions. That doesn't seem no. like very much. Sorry. So, so it's $464,000 in stipends, um, $219,874 in, in the specialist, and one hundred and twenty-one dollars for the coordinator. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. 
Um, and then I uh, want to follow up. I appreciate Ms. Smondrowski already asked a question around um, looking at, we've been here seeing a lot of advocacy around the um, extension of the enriched literacy curriculum to the remaining 60 elementary schools with questions around why it's that's that extension to those remaining 60 elementary schools is only going to grade four, not five. Um, so in addition to her question, I, I am also curious when we're looking at, it was mentioned earlier by Ms. Um, um, Hazel, the, uh, uh, an RFP for new ELA uh, English language arts curricula. But we, uh, we did do this just before the pandemic. I appreciated the fact that that process seemed very uh, robust in its engagement piece, having lots of stakeholders review the the um, the uh, products that came in through the RFP, looking at what the vendors were offering and making the selection. So I'd like to get a better understanding, and maybe now is not the time, but as to why, given that we just did that three years ago, we're already looking to a new ELA curriculum. Um, and what that you know, and if we the goal is to have a new curriculum in place, are we? Do we have the the professional development in this budget to support that curriculum? Yes. <clears throat> so to respond to the enriched literacy curriculum question, um, we really would prefer to roll out grade four this school year or for next school year, and then four five because we want to think about the experience of the student. Those students who are going to go into grade five next year have benchmark, then they would go to ELC, and then they're going to go to sixth grade and they're going to have a new curriculum. So that's three different curricula for one student in three years. So we are really trying to have some consistency from the student experience. That's, that's one reason. We are also thinking about implementation. And from the school perspective, in terms of managing implementation, knowing that we also have new curriculum coming on board, we were really trying to think about what was more manageable for schools, implementation and support, and then the budget was the third reason. So it was all, all of those things combined, but budget really was not the primary reason. And so I, I, do, I do really want to make sure that that's clear. Our first um, consideration was the students and their experience. Mm -hmm. um, when we talk about the new curriculum process, um, and we we had we were trying to implement or bring on four new curricula, two at the elementary level and two at the middle school level. It was a lot to do at one time. Um, we had well over 200 people involved in a process looking at four different. Um, products, so it's really much more than four because you have multiple for literacy, multiple for math, and, and so on. Um, in hindsight, probably wouldn't do, do it that at large scale uh, again, but just taking one product, um, the typically what will happen is the vendors will send you samples, and when we received the samples, um, they seemed they seemed fine um, in terms of um, what we were reviewing in on our rubric. What we, um, as we dug in more and more and looked at the day-to-day -day lessons, we saw that there were some um, resources that we questioned around race and equity that we didn't see when we did the initial um, review. And also, as we learned more about the science of reading, we recognized that that was a missed opportunity to find something that had a strong um, foundational program. So as we are building out our rubric for the new RFP and the new curriculum, we have stronger look force for the race and equity components, and we have stronger look force for the, the structured literacy that we didn't have in our original. Um, and then we just have more teachers and more principals also involved in the process of reviewing the curriculum, the, the number of resources that we have. Thank you. And I appreciate you raising the science of reading because I, um, I, I was uh, so interested to see when you all presented on the science of reading at the board table last spring and this nine schools that did that pilot, how successful it was, so good, we're going to all schools, all elementary schools for this, this academic year. So I'm really gonna be looking forward to seeing how that 
that embracing of the science of reading and now embracing the science of reading in the in the review of, of new curricula, how that translates to our students' performance. Um, and I um, and it, so I want to make sure that that science of reading, you know, that that professional development required to do that with fidelity throughout the system is there. But you also presented on our math. And I, I apologize, and I don't remember even what it was called, but there was some really exciting information you shared about the way students, you know, the way we were teaching math now, something that we learned during the pandemic. Some schools had piloted some work, and we were going to really grow that. And is that reflected in our in our either an accelerators or a regular budget to make sure that that professional development is happening to help develop that really robust instructional approach throughout our schools? Yes, and I didn't fully answer your first question around the professional development and if, it, if it's built in. So it is built in, um, the resources and the professional development is built in the budget. Um, and also, I believe what you were referring to are some new assessment tools um, that we had purchased for mathematics with our Eureka program um, that allow teachers um, to very quickly assess students and, and make decisions for for students. And we saw academic gains from, from the schools that got started with that first implementation. It wasn't a pilot, they kind of volunteered, um, but we saw some some nice gains for those from those schools. And so our math team is working with the additional schools to build this into their programming. Okay, and that's reflected in our budget. Support. Yes, it's a part of our instructional materials. All right, thank you. And then last thing, I just want to, you know, echo um, Ms. Evans and Dr. McKnight mentioned, you know, how so much of the, some of the work that we need to do right now is just work that we can't do on our own. We really need to bring in the partners mm -hmm. robustly. And I just wanted to, you know, sometimes we haven't been as welcoming as we needed to be to some of our community partners. And then I think culturally it's been an effort to get some areas of our system to actually admit when we don't have the expertise we need to do some of the work we need to do. And so, uh, you know, I just hope we are really, uh, you know, looking at this more as this is a community work and we really need to embrace the expertise in our community that can help us serve students and families better. And because I would just note at, in July at our board meeting, um, Ms. Goldberg came to the table with an idea for how we could get LCSW support robustly into the system by tapping into the enormous resource provided by her uh, professional association in the DMV. But that didn't really go anywhere. And when I tried to I pursued inside the system, it was like a, they had some conversations with HR, but nobody, you know, kind of built the positions in. And so, but that was, uh, to me, a little bit perhaps of a missed opportunity to tap into that resource that came to us and said, we have the skills you need. We have the desire to help you. We can't, you know, come in and work for you full time, but TPT, part time, we're here. Let us be part of the work. So I, I mean, that's just to me is one way we need to be better at really embracing the the expertise that surrounds us, but it maybe isn't necessarily in us. And so just our community partnerships, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. We have a process check. We still have another set of accelerators. One final slide, is that correct? Yes. Yes, and some board members have to leave at three o'clock. Um, so I want us to be mindful of our questions as we finish up this conversation and then transition to the last slide. Mrs. Madrowski. Um, back to the uh, accelerator for um, administrative help with 504 plans. Um, I feel very strongly that we need a lot more support for our special education. Our teachers are overwhelmed. Our, our you know, even our, um, school um, psychologists and, and things like that. Like everybody, the counselors, they're all working overtime. I'm not sure that I feel how, or see how effective was it three positions and small stipends is going to be. And I'm just curious as to how you came up with that amount. I mean, you know, I hear from, again, like a school psychologist who works on nights and weekends to try and catch up with their thing, um, assessments. I'm not sure how much different an assessment is from a, um, from a, um, 
the evaluations or whatever. But the point being, with the stipends even, do our 12-month employees, are they eligible for a stipend, if that's what you mean by getting a stipend to compensate for the extra amount of work that's being put in? And, you know, this is one of those situations, in my opinion, where we need to hire our way out of some of this work. I mean, our special education folks are just taking a beating and hanging in there because they're so passionate about the work that they do. But I just think, I feel like if this might be something that we should be evaluating, whether or not, how effective that, those, that small amount of resources is gonna to be to help a situation that's doubled in five years, to quote you. Absolutely. So I will address some of the, the 504 pieces then, and thank you for uh, Diana Wiles to come up from my associate colleague from special education to field some of those pieces. So as I heard you, um, so yes, psychologists, absolutely. And, and we have been talking to, again, it's a psychologist group through MCA about what a, um, a like Dr. <laughs> Dr. McKnight said, we're in a place right now with mental health professionals where we are not competing against other public schools. We're not in a public school labor market, say for a PE teacher right out of college. We are in a labor market with private sector, non-private medical fields for the, these professionals. Um, and so I have been in conversations with Dr. Marks throughout the year about how we can pot potentially um, make our, our psychologist positions more attractive financially, right? Um, uh, you know, what, what that may be, if it's a different pay scale, if it's bringing in a different step. So we are talking about those pieces. Um, the, the, just the, the psychologists that are working at night, right? I'm aware of that. We, we did develop in partnership with all, with our psych, all of our psychologists and their representatives um, a, a way to, to compensate them for this work, right? So they are agreeing to take on some additional pieces and they are being paid um, uh, at a salary that was negotiated with them to, that, that merits that work. To the, the 504 pieces, you're right, Ms. Mondrowski. I think a coordinator position and a couple specialists and a stipend is not going to solve this problem, right? These continue to go up, the, the, the 504s, for a variety of reasons. Um, but it is a step, right, in the right direction, I believe, based on the feedback that we have received from the counselors that we've been working with. Um, and we could get some street data or some feedback data from the schools where we have used a specialist this year to plug right in to see how that support has been. Um, I think ultimately, you know, there are ways to look at this nationwide and, and throughout the state as to how people administer 504s. Um, and it, 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 there's a variety of ways as that that is done. It's most in the state of Maryland, almost almost exclusively, and, and um, as Wiles can, can tell you, it is done through counselors, um, and that is where that's the model that we're trying to work through right now. So uh, before you, okay, I just want to sure. just want to comment on the fact that I appreciate what you said about school psychologists, but it's like you know I heard, we heard from a speech pathologist you know the other day who where the problem that I'm having is is that. We can't find enough people to hire in special education, so and people are feeling so overwhelmed and so overworked that they're leaving, and then the people who stay are even more overwhelmed and overworked. And while I appreciate what you were saying about this is a small step, and it is a step in the right direction for sure, we're always growing. And I feel like we do this, not just with this issue, but on a lot of things where we don't want to put too big of a chunk of money in because we, you know, have so many things that we need money for, but we're never caught up. We're, we're always playing catch up because we keep growing. And so I'm just trying to say that I, I appreciate what you're saying and I don't disagree. I just am questioning whether or not it's going to have enough of an impact to change anybody's lives, <laughs> even a little bit. Good afternoon, Dr. McKnight and board members. I just wanted to clarify, <coughs> this accelerator for Section 504 is not related to special education. Currently, what we have is a, a, an office of one and, I'll say one and a half, people who handle Section 504 compliance. Um, be, let, me, let me back up, before this year, we have uh, myself who is still named on the, uh, 
website as the coordinator for Section 504. And then we had one instructional specialist in the Resolution and Compliance Unit, and that was the um, staffing. This year, fortunately, we were able to add um, under uh, Dr. Cruz, who handles uh, counselors, another instructional specialist. So we have two instructional specialists and a, and a coordinator that is not a position, it's a title in the district because it's required that there is a coordinator. This accelerator would allow for three, is it three additional instructional specialists? Um, two or three additional instructional specialists and then a, co a funded coordinator position for Section 504. That position was not funded in the past. It was just a title um, given to the person who actually was a supervisor for Resolution Compliance Unit, historically. What this allows us to do is to be aligned more closely with how this work is done in our neighboring districts, where they have four or five or more instructional specialists that help with compliance, they help with training, they help with implementation, of 504 plans in, um, in the schools. The distinction is students with 504s are not, they are general education students identified with disabilities who need accommodations to access the curriculum. With regard to special education, um, if you recall during uh, my presentation in chapter one, we've added 135, 135 positions um, to account for the growth in our enrollment. Um, and that has, that's the largest number that we have added for several years. Um, so we are addressing, uh, while we do have, have to address the vacancy issues, um, we're also addressing a need for additional staff for special education. So those 134 would be added on to, essentially, would be working in partnership with the, the uh, these three to address the over need, over, okay. No, those are two different. Sorry, I'm not really getting it. No, it's, it's fine. Um, Section 504 is general education. Yes, I get it. So I get it. they. That's my son. The, right. Yeah. So while some of the work is done through the Office of Special Education, uh -huh. what this accelerator is allowing us to do is to continue the compliance work okay. through, through the Office of Special Education. Got that part. Um, and the actual work to support the schools, the training, the um, assistance to the counselors would be handled under um, these positions. Correct, correct. It does not, okay, and then the right. other ones are the ones that will help with paperwork? The other ones, what? The 134? The 134 positions, one. 135 positions in Chapter 1 are directly related to uh, positions in the schools, so those are teacher level positions that account for our growth in programming for students with disabilities, special education students with disabilities. So those are actual positions in the schools. Right, if we can find the people to hire. Okay. All right, um, let, why don't we hold our questions to the end and let's see this final slide. Some board members have to leave, so I want them to at least see the final slide and then we'll continue with your most pressing questions at the end. I, I am also holding my questions until the end. All right, thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> So uh, I want to address Ms. Harris's question uh, that she had posed about the bus app. Um, I guess it was quite a while ago now. Um, so uh, if we can go to the previous slide, please. Um, so we do see the transportation uh, piece here, and that is because uh, we really view this in addition to being an operational uh, efficiency, we also see this as a, a key component, a key lever for communication with our families. So that's why it falls here. And you'll see uh, a similar, you'll see transportation noted on the other slide as well for some different things. So not all of these fall perfectly neatly in one bucket or the other, there's some overlap. And so we did uh, put the bus app here. And to answer your question, Ms. Harris, um, 
there are three components to the RFP, which is currently out and we're receiving bids on right now. One is routing to make sure that we are um, using the most efficient uh, routes possible, which minimizes the number of routes, minim minimizes uh, the number of drivers that we need. Um, the other piece is the GPS tracking. So making sure that all of our buses uh, are outfitted with GPS trackers so that we know where they are at all times. It also will allow us uh, to gather data on uh, how uh, the efficiency of our routes and um, where you know we may be able to make additional um, you know uh, efficiencies there. And then the third piece is the parent app. So it, it'll be connected um, and provide uh, real-time data on where the buses are. At least this is what you know we're requesting proposals on um, where the bus is. If there are ever late routes uh, for you know one reason or another, uh, parents would be notified automatically through this app. And so there are the three components to that. Um, and you know we've got a, a very large transportation budget. Uh, we run over 1,200 routes every every day. Uh, we transport over 100,000 students every day, and we drive uh, over 100,000 miles every day, or roughly, uh, actually more than the equivalent of driving around the equator of the Earth four times each day, transporting our students to and from school. And so making sure that we have the technology to support our drivers and our routers is absolutely critical uh, to if, you know, effectively running a transportation department of this size. Thank you for that. We could move on, Ms. Sharon. Okay, thank you. Um, next slide. So what we're going to highlight here um, on the accelerator conversation is around technology, and I'm going to speak to a few of them. The first one, technology support interactive boards and Chromebooks. And before I begin, I want to address what we've been hearing a lot here from the board and during the conversation is, you know, how are we seeing the investments that we're making impacting our black and brown children? And I will say that this investment in our technology support interactive uh, boards and Chromebooks are doing just that and will do just that. And one of the primary things that I think we need to think about is when we're thinking about how we're transforming the educational experience for our black and brown children, it doesn't always look like additional bodies, but it looks like how we are changing the way we work and changing the way that we're interacting with our students students to promote success. Technology allows us to do that. Um, the technology supports that we are proposing in the accelerator are going to be providing students and teachers the ability to be able to differentiate their instruction, allow students to demonstrate their knowledge and understanding in different ways, and provide access and opportunity to students who may not have otherwise had access and opportunity to technology resources in the past. When we think about well-being work, we got to think about the fact that our technology Technology allows us to meet the needs of more students through psychological services or therapy through having the te necessary technology. That's just another example I wanted to share. So under this accelerator, under technology support, we are proposing to add six new um, ITSSs to the schools. Um, currently, we have not increased our ITSS support. These are the people that are boots on the ground, that are at the schools that provide that on-site technical assistance with the, with the interactive panels, the Chromebooks for students and staff in the building. We have added 12 new schools since 2016 and have not increased our number of, of staff for that. Uh, currently, we are residing at a ITSS to end user rate of one to 17, 17 to 1,800 end users, we are going to be moving that with these six to one to 1,500, um, which is much more um, doable. It will also allow ITSSs to attend schools currently. They, they have four schools they share. They only can attend once a week. This will allow an increase in about a two time a week. Um, so that will be providing more on-demand support. We're gonna be tracking the, the uh, implications of that through monitoring our wait times for our service now and help desk tickets and how quickly we get resolved. As I said previously, we don't want you to see us. We want everything to happen seamlessly. And when you don't see us and, 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 and don't even know that we're there, that's when we know we're doing something well. Um, additionally, 
when we think about the interactive uh, boards and the Chromebooks, as you know, and as I had stated previously, um, the CIP budget has traditionally uh, paid for a lot of our technology equipment. However, with the influx of ESSER funds and the, the influx of technology that we experienced from the pandemic, we added a lot of technologies. Zoom is a great example of a technology we don't want to go away but is not currently being paid for on the CIP budget um, and is actually one of those technologies that is becoming integral to just the operations of our school community uh, to promote equity for all. Um, for the interactive panels, um, ESSER has uh, effectively purchased 7,000 interactive boards for our classrooms to update the Promethean technology that is in some cases almost 20 years old. Old. So we are bringing this back, and this money will allow us to complete the remaining roughly 900 interactive panels that need to be installed uh, so that we can bring our district and for our teachers to have the most updated materials that they need. Chromebooks is another thing that, yes, we do fund part of that through a CIP, but with the one-to-one -one model that we have um, currently initiated as a result of the pandemic, we also need to be adding additional uh, monies and fees to be able to maintain that for our students K through 12. So that seven million will purchase about 20,000 uh, Chromebooks. And like I said, we go on a five-year refresh cycle with, this, uh, with, with these Chromebooks in order to keep them with the most current operating systems. We need to retire them after five years or they will not be able to be utilized for mandatory state testing, for instance. So that is why we keep to that refresh cycle. Um, Again, the hot spots in my FIs never did that before uh, the pandemic. And now we realize as a result of the pandemic that 12 to 13,000 of our families are utilizing that as another equity tool at home for their students to be able to engage in, in the learning process. So uh, we want to continue that. So that is the, another part of that funding that is being um, added on to that. And then um, the last thing I do want to mention about the human capital management project, um, we are adding that 2.6 as an accelerator. Uh, this is to build out the human capital management project. And as I, I heard Rebecca make some comments about the length of time, and I, and I do want to say, yes, it does take a long time, but I also want to uh, highlight a few things about that. The first, one of the major phases that we're dealing with which, with the HCM project is around payroll, leave, benefits. That impacts every single employee and retiree in our system. There is zero margin for error. Okay, we know that people need to get paid, for instance. Right now, and as we've been going through the project, it's not just about people stopping the work they're currently doing and just working on the HCM. They actually are doing two jobs in, in, in some instances. They're maintaining the old enterprise system while at the same time trying to launch the, um, the new system. So that does take some time, stakeholder engagement, content expert work. Um, so that's one of the reasons that it does take um, a longer time than anticipated with this, because we don't have much margin for error. And that's it. I'll turn it over to the board or Mr. Hall. Yes, absolutely. Great. And I'll just run through the rest of these um, relatively quickly here. So the next one you see there is a professional uh, development day for our SEIU uh, employees. So this is something that we have not done in the past, but we've heard a lot of um, interest in this from our employees as far as having a dedicated day uh, for professional development for all of our staff. And so this would give us an opportunity to bring our SEIU folks in uh, for a day. Uh, again, this it would be a day that was previously no work, no pay for those folks, which we know can be a hardship for many. And so in addition to providing a full day of professional development, it will also provide um, you know another day of work for our uh, SEIU folks. Um, again, you'll see the transportation facility management on this uh, page here. As I said, this one kind of splits across the different um initiative or um, strategic priorities. So the additional piece with transportation here would be the split of the West Farm Depot. That is our, our largest uh, single depot right now and it has just become operationally difficult to manage. And so what we are proposing to do there is to split it, have uh, a depot manager um, for each depot along with a dispatcher and a routing supervisor for each of the two depots. And we believe that this will um, really uh, help improve uh, um, 
uh, the morale and the operations of that particular depot. And we're also bringing on a couple of positions to help support specifically with the needs that arise from our uh, new and growing electric fleet. They have some slightly different needs than our uh, old diesel fleet does. And so just making sure that we've got the supports there for these 300 plus buses uh, that we are uh, investing heavily in going forward. Um, the other piece out of that is the maintenance piece. So we have, as you've probably heard, Mr. Adams uh, say before, we have over 30 million square feet of um, building space in this county. And um, as we heard earlier today, there is a need for additional uh, maintenance and facility uh, work, specifically in some of these uh, really specific areas around HVAC, plumbing, electrical, uh, carpentry. And so we want to uh, bring in some additional positions specifically to address those acute needs that I think we've all heard throughout the budget hearing process is a, is a high need and a high priority of our students in our schools. Um, and then the last piece, uh, I guess there's two more. Finance, um, there's not much of an ad there. We did move procurement, as Mr. Riley mentioned, um, over from uh, uh, materials management into finance, and we're going to add a contract administrator. We currently have one contract administrator for the entire district. Uh, in Minneapolis, where I worked previously, we had one contract administrator for a district, uh, you know, about a quarter this size. And so uh, we really need some additional support there. And then finally, uh, with the human resources piece, uh, Dr. Marks had mentioned earlier some additional support around hiring. It's not just the recruiting, it's also the onboarding, the hiring piece around our administrative staff, um, some background screening positions to help us work through the backlog there. Um, and then the last piece is the um, $300,000 for consulting services for the professional growth systems. And so uh, I'm sure you're all aware our professional growth systems have been around for many, many years. They're a key way in which our administration interacts with our uh, teachers and our staff. Uh, it also includes our uh, staff evaluations. And so uh, what we're proposing is to bring in an outside consultant, again, someone that you know has done this across states, across districts, and really has expertise in this particular area where they can lend um, some, and again, this would be in a uh you know, consultation and, and uh, collaboration with our association partners, but just bringing in some fresh ideas on how maybe we could improve these systems to make sure that they're really working uh, and benefiting uh, our staff and, and then by um, connection to our students there as well. We know that, you know, evaluations and these kind of growth pro and, this, and the support that goes along with it as well, the consulting teachers and consulting principals can be very effective if it is done correctly. And so we want to make sure that we are maximizing maximizing uh, this. We spend a lot of time, our principals, our you know, directors, everyone spends a lot of time on these. So we want to make sure that it's effective and that we're actually getting what we want out of our professional growth systems. And so those are kind of the big highlights from the operational side of things. And I'll uh, pause there and we can take questions. Okay. All right, board members, uh, please uh, turn on your light if you have any pressing f questions about this section or any pressing questions about um, what, you, uh, what you've heard today. Um, I will start with Ms. Yang. Oh, sorry. No, nope. okay. To. Ms. Rivera <laughs> Alvin. Um, just a quick question on the app for the transportation app. So it's, it's not an app, it's, it's broader than an app, right? We, I know it's kind of, it says an app, but. It, <laughs> Right, so the, the app is that. the parent app is one piece of the larger yeah, uh, system. Yes, correct. Yeah, so my my question is on, is on the parent app. When you guys do do the RFP, are you going to ensure that that app is in the top seven languages that our students speak, so there's it's actually able to be used by everyone? Yes, absolutely. We're going to take that into consideration. If it doesn't reach all of our families, it's not much good to us. And so, yes, uh, that will be part of the process is making sure that whoever is bidding uh, for this contract is able to uh, provide the service in multiple languages. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Madrowski. Um, one comment and then one question. Professional development, just making sure that we're really focusing on core content areas because one thing I keep hearing from teachers is you know they want more support and how to implement the best um, teaching um, 
that they can to, to get the best results so we can actually, you know, help support seeing growth in our students' success. Yeah, and I think that's a great point, Ms. Mondrowski, and I think this is where we start talking about how we're innovating and changing the way we work, mm -hmm. um, not necessarily about the bodies, but about the professional learning. So obviously that core content is, is critical, right? Mm -hmm. But also how do we engage with our students around teaching and learning to set the conditions so that that content can be delivered and received in the way that we, we intend. And this is really where we are gonna be seeing through professional learning that marrying between the anti-racist audit findings mm -hmm. and then that content and that instructional pedagogy, right? Because they don't exist in isolation, so neither should the professional learning. If you don't set the conditions for all students to be able to be successful and feel safe and heard, as very much what we heard in the anti-racist audit, you can do all the pedagogy that you want and you're gonna to continue to see the disparities exist. So really the vision behind how we're, how we're addressing that professional learning is through that two-prong approach. Um, but yes, absolutely, I know that the curriculum and OSIP team are working diligently on a lot of that work around that's really content specific. Mm -hmm. um, and district-wide professional learning is thinking about how we're really setting those conditions and that common understanding of what that means from an SEIU member or a paraeducator in that classroom all the way up to the instructional leader or the principal in that, um, that class. Because we all have to, in a school, because we all have to work together in order to meet the needs of all of our kids. And I appreciate that. Um, my other, my question, question really is um, about stipends. And um, not exactly sure how to phrase this question. Um, maybe it's for Dr. Murphy, I don't know. but. You know, I know that we differentiate how much each school gets in terms of stipends, um, but I also know that there are some concerns over, number one, um, accessibility to to them for staff members. Um, again, like 12-month employees being able to be eligible to participate in an after-school club thing, or you know, and and receive a stipend for it. Or um, I don't know. I think there's. There are a bunch of different kind of restrictions, if you will, or whatever. Um, so, a looking, how are we looking at that in terms of making sure that what we are um, setting aside to support staff is actually being effective or managed in a way that makes a sense for them. Um, and then also, you know, I, we like I was saying, we differentiate how much we set aside for stipends for each school based on the needs. But we still continually hear during public hearings and old cluster meetings and, and things like that that, you know, some schools seem to have so much more. And I get that some schools have PTAs that can raise a significant amount of money. Others have no PTA at all. But if we're, I'm, I'm curious and concerned about how we're still, if we're trying to supplement the difference in private funding, if you will, if you want to call it that or whatever, in other words, PTA fundraising and things like that, why are we still seeing such a, a wide um, differential in terms of what some schools can do and what some schools can't? Is it, you know, I just, I feel like if school A can do 10 field trips, then school B should be able to do 10 field trips. And even if school A funds half of those field trips on their own, see what I, I guess what I'm trying to get at is, what I'm afraid is happening is, school A can fund, we fund five field trips for them, but then they can fund through the PTA five more. We we might fund five field trips for school B, but they can't afford the extra five, so then they're still just getting less. and I'm, I know some of it may be uh, policy issues, but some of it I also um, just want to check in and see if we, how we're monitoring what is an adequate amount of money to supply our schools, how frequently we check in on that because costs have gone up um, for everything, and, um, and how we're getting feedback from the schools in terms of whether or not it's enough or it's effectively, you know, people feel good about the fact that we just put that money in there. If that. Okay. So is that something you can 
touch base with the, uh, Mrs. Madrowski to provide her some more background on? Or? Sure, I'll follow up, and I'd like to know uh, maybe a little bit more particulars, uh, that this is a familiar or not an uncommon uh, issue among districts, so uh, you and I can talk. Okay. Ms. Harris. Yeah, I think this question goes to Ms. Sharon. So with the 13.8 million technology accelerator, I think you said this, I just want to be clear, that will allow us to replace all of the outdated Prometheans. Most, all, almost all of them, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so the ones that are left will not be in core instructional spaces. But in maybe Correct. ancillary spaces yes. like yes. meeting rooms and okay. Yes. Thank you. I remember when those were the next great thing. Right. Now they're, yeah. now they're obsolete. Right. Now, yep. <laughs> yeah. Break them down for parts. Um, and I just want to say I really appreciate the way the uh, the inclusion of the six new ITSS positions comes with sort of that ongoing monitoring and evaluation piece to see how that is impacting um, help desk tickets, quick resolution, that kind of thing. So I, I think I really do appreciate that approach. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to um, ask my questions as follow-ups as a, in the interest of time and Mr. Kimmel get you if you do have a final question. Um, I did want to um, ask Ms. Sharon, we have built a very robust strategic plan and monitoring system. And so a lot of our questions about effectiveness of reading and math are built into the strategic plan. So please um, share with the board as follow-ups any data that you have to support some of the questions that you've heard today about show us the improvements, show us the improvements. We should be seeing improvements on a regular basis as a part of our strategic plan reporting. And so I don't want our, our um, so that process to go to waste. I want to make sure the board and send it by email, print it out, put it in front of our faces. Mm -hmm. uh, so make sure that we, we are getting that information on a regular basis. Okay, my questions, I'll be as quick as I can. Um, I want to understand the difference in outcomes between summer school outcomes and the innovative calendar. So they both give students more time. I want to understand the cost. I know the cost for the innovative calendar. I want to understand the cost of summer school and the outcomes for each. Does that question make sense? Mm -hmm. Great question. Okay. Um, tutoring, uh, 14,000 students. You said that the, the what works is with teachers, high quality, high dose. How many of our students are in that high quality, high dose with the tutoring with teachers? You said 50, you gave uh, 14,000, but how many are actually getting the, the model that works? Um, another question related to that, I wanna understand why we're putting tutoring in the budget when it can also be paid with ESSER. I think the question is, it's the placeholder for future years, but I want to fully understand why we're doing that and why can't it just go back to ESSER for one more year um, and we can utilize that money for maybe reading and math as we have heard an interest from the board. Um, let's see, Christians. That's all I have, I just a comment, uh, I'm remembering Dr. Joftis. Um, I, I wrote down, what are we doing about reading and math? We're doing the in-class interventions, Ms. Hazel mentioned on-time professional development so that our teachers are teaching to grade level standards, the reading specialists in every school, the science of reading, pre-K. Um, but Dr. Joftis would tell us that we have to do evaluations on how that's going. How is the implementation of those strategies going? We as board members don't know anything about that and that's probably some of the tension that you hear today is we don't see what you're doing about reading and math, but there's all this happening, but we have no idea how well that's being implemented and the, how well that's being implemented is critical to the outcomes that we're going to see in academic achievement in reading and math. Um, doc, uh, Mr. Kim, do you have a final question? Teeny tiny little final question. Um, 
So going back a while now to the Virtual Academy again, um, thank you for providing some clarity on that investment. I just want to ask one more thing about it. Should have asked it earlier. It kind of came to mind um, as we were talking here. Um, so this investment, you know, what I heard is that it's really going to being able to support uh, perhaps a wider breadth of students to the same kind of programming. Um, the, the examples you mentioned, the, the compact math and the that, that French class. So I'm wondering, I guess, in essence, how one-to-one -one this investment is. In, in other words, if we were able to allocate more towards it, would we very directly be able to support more students uh, in this kind of programming? It's a great question. I'd say theoretically, yes, but the ability to provide this type of hybrid, right, or boutique course or unique course for students as really an equity lever across the district um, is predicated a, a, around a lot of things. And as we did it, we did explore this. We explored the option of um, figuring out a way to have students be able to literally match their, their brick and mortar schedules with the MBA schedule, and it wasn't operationally feasible this year. So if we were to, right, so theoretically, if we were to be able to have a really streamlined way of having students, say, enroll or a, a, a sign up for classes, right, so if students in a perfect world, and this is a vision, right, this is an innovation down the road, perfect world, the student goes and it, on, on their student view or synergy to enroll for classes in December or January. They see what's available at their school. They see what's available at the MBA. They can say, you know, this isn't available in my school. It may be available in the MBA. And then we would be able to coordinate that uh, through uh, the interface of those master scheduling systems. That is way pie in the sky type stuff. And we would also have to have coordination from each of the schools location, supervision of student who is taking that course, right, virtually at the MBA. So it, theoretically, yes, but this person, from the MBA standpoint alone, when they get, when they figure out, we've got 130 students across the district that want to take math 4-5 and 45-5-6, and we've, we're offering this new course in high, in, in high school in engineering and virtual engineering, whatever it may be, and we've got this many students that want to take that, the coordination, there's no one fell swoop way to coordinate all of that right now. So literally one person has to go through and work through the problems that may be associated logistically student by student. That's what that person is doing now. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, okay. thank you. Thank you everyone. Um, as we conclude this uh, budget work session, I wanna thank you all for your patience. Uh, we. We as board members have a lot of questions because we truly want to understand um, our budget process. And um, we want to uh, make sure that the majority of our students are being helped. Again, uh, you heard that emphasis on literacy and math, literacy and math. And so I, I think that there were still some questions here today about what we're doing. We're trying to get to the bottom of um, are we seeing enough of an intervention in literacy and math. I heard eighth grade math was a problem yesterday at the press conference. Um, um, I will confer with my board members over the next couple of weeks to figure out if they heard enough around <coughs> literacy and math um, to see what we as a board do uh, move forward as we approve this budget on February 23rd. Uh, one final follow-up, if I may, um, that we are, we talked about the uh, Thursday uh, special pops meeting tomorrow, uh, which will include the ESOL audit. Um, I don't see any budget recommendations about the ESOL audit recommendations, and so I want to understand why not. And so that, that's another follow-up. So again, thank you for your work. Um, uh, the, the, the board members will continue to um, think through uh, what we need to um, change in terms of a budget amendment if that's necessary, but we really want to emphasize uh, literacy and math so that it reaches 160,000 plus students in the system. Thank you, have a good afternoon. Thank you.